Thank you everyone for coming uh, to this very important event and thank you so very much for allowing me to share my story. So this is Red Hawk to Red Hawk, connecting to and leading as a student with social justice initiatives. My name is Melissa Velez and I'm a proud Red Hawk. You're not alone, even when it feels like you are. As a first generation bodega kid from Jersey City, I remember how scared I was starting at MSU. Apparently there were deer and skunks in New Jersey and those were just two discoveries making me feel out of place. I didn't think I could talk to anyone about growing up with parents working 14 hours daily, Monday through Saturday, and Sundays being downright luxurious at only eight hours. No other nine-year-olds had rushed to the bodega to help with the after-school rush, nor was identifying counterfeit bills part of anyone else's lessons about money and making change. Who else had sat at their Thanksgiving table aware that half the family was absent? left behind in poverty, starving in their parents' country. Now that I was in college, I empathized with the daughters of the Joy Luck Club in a whole new way, as I felt the weight of my parents' years of sacrifices and hopes and dreams resting on me. So yeah, no pressure. If I could pull a share and turn back time or find a hopeful traveler in a blue box, I'd like to pass that younger version of me a note saying, you're not alone. Go to the SGA office and ask about student clubs and you'll figure out the stairs and layout for Dixon Hall. Trust me on this one. Eventually, I found more than I thought was possible. I made my way to the student center and became involved with a few student government association clubs where I met lifelong friends from diverse backgrounds. Um, I'm talking like sib from another crib level of peeps. I became a Latin American Latino studies minor and declared double majors. All were part of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. So yeah, it all worked out, even though there were some initial bumps, bruises, and big feelings of isolation. I found at home at MSU, explored social justice in the classroom, and also as part of those SGA clubs. Um, I used Hire Red Hawk to find a job after graduation, and for a few years, I was only an alumna until I decided to change my career to higher education. Fast forward a few scenes, and now I'm part of the psychology department's undergraduate advising team. Thank you, psychology. Love this job. So I can safely say that I think I mostly get it and that I know you're definitely not alone. Being a student, finding your peeps, discovering fields and causes you're passionate about, and moments of feeling like you're utterly failing at adulting before you've really had the chance to decently adult are part of the journey, I promise you. Unfortunately, sometimes so are the feelings of uncertainty when thinking about the future of wondering how a student can have any kind of real impact when it seems that most real adults don't take you seriously and dismiss your goals, your causes, approaches, and opinions. Yet some other adults are saying, you're the future, you're gonna change things. So which is it? Some are foisting, fixing hundreds of years of injustice and world mess onto your shoulders alone. But others say that you can't seem to do anything right and that you are out of touch with the real world. Okay, we need to cancel those critics. We cannot allow them to take up residency in our heads. Hopefully our brief talk today will help you start to frame your questions as opportunities and you can explore them with your fellow Red Hawks in and out of the classroom. As Dr. Cole wrote recently, all of our work together is based on our commitment to the concept that every individual is entitled to participate in and have access to the benefits of our society, to education, of course, but also to the larger protections of social justice as we grieve for the innocent lives lost. We need to strengthen our resolve to be part of the creation of a better world, a world in which reason and compassion prevail over ignorance and hatred. Students as leaders, campus and community engagement. As a student, one of the first things that helped me with feelings of isolation was to connect with diverse groups of student leaders on campus cultural, subject, and interest-based student groups can and did have diverse leadership 
and can co-create multiple partnerships across the board. If you're looking for ways to blend your interests in celebrating diversity, promoting inclusivity, and developing organizational and event planning skills, this may be a way to do all of those things while engaging with the important issues of our times. Nonprofit organizations co-sponsor and build coalitions as well. So volunteering in student clubs now may be a good way to explore questions before they arise elsewhere. Hawk Sync and the SGA have the, student, the campus uh, student clubs listed. I believe Hawk Sync is changing their name soon, so more to come on that. Um, you can also find affiliated student organizations in some academic department pages, like psychology. Uh, student clubs have partnered with faculty and staff to explore topics such as how gender and cultural identity influence each other. So anything that happens in the real world affects the campus too. The difference is that we tend to have a more supportive community dedicated to informed and civil discourse. We have faculty experts who can help students focus on relevant research and evidence-based findings. If you've ever been frustrated that you're just a student and that it's not big enough that you're being selfish for prioritizing your studies, that your time in college is not really related to the bigger work ahead, and that you shouldn't focus on student clubs at a time like this, I invite you to reconsider. I've witnessed fellow students leverage experience in student clubs and the focus of their studies to land internships while finishing their last years at MSU. And their jobs now span political, cultural, and governmental positions. Some are the top leaders and others are part of the broader leadership teams, but all are contributing in a very direct way towards creating solutions for our present day challenges. Some of these questions that I have on the bottom, we will talk about later. Connecting to academics, intentionally crafting your programs. Informed civil discourse begins but does not end in the classroom. Across campus, there may be different focuses for each college and school, but no matter the subject, that is the foundation of the classroom. In CHSS alone, there are a robust number of options for studying the intersection of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusivity through different lenses, anthropological, linguistic, sociological, psychological, religious, philosophical, political, historical, and trust me, I could go on. A good number of programs draw from multiple fields and thus bring the strength of interdisciplinary approaches to the studies. As a bonus, some general education categories help introduce you to many of these fields while creating diverse and foundational knowledge from which you will build. In psychology alone, we have faculty members directing two of the college's minors, African American studies and leadership development through civic engagement. Both minors are interdisciplinary and have courses that overlap with CHSS programs and various general education course options. Going forward, I could continue listing so many of the opportunities across the campus and how they complete each other and what they will give to you both personally and academically, but we'd probably be here for a day or two. And this isn't about me, it's about you. And I hope that I can model leadership by saying that it starts with listening. StoryCorps says that listening is an act of love. I truly hope that in these times we can give each other that love and space to quote, normalize changing your mind when presented with new information, end quote. I hope we give each other spaces for nonviolent communication, spaces for discovery through research being guided by professors, spaces for true discussion about how we co-create that better world, spaces to figure out who we are by reading and researching something new, Spaces for people who don't need to look like you to become those lifelong connections because it really does turn out that you shared way more than you could have predicted. Spaces for Red Hawks to fly. If anyone has questions or comments, you could raise your hand or write in the chat box and we'll call on you guys.
So what brought you here? Melissa, Casey is asking if they should answer your questions. Oh yes, feel free to jump in on any and all of that. I think about a bunch of questions all at the same time, just jump in. Casey, I see your hand. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I have to introduce myself. I'm, I'm Casey. I'm actually not a psychology person. I'm a German major, but I was invited here. So um, something that I, I wanted to answer was the, um, about the organizations. And I think, first of all, I'm actually obligated to answer it, that I do read the, read the uh, what's it called, the emails, <laughs> because I'm, I'm obligated to. I'm a, I'm a part of Team Rocky. And um, Team Rocky is part of this uh, communications board. So, so uh, we're, we could get in big trouble if we don't read that because uh, the organization who runs Rocky also writes those emails. So we're supposed to know what's going on. Um, anyway, about uh, clubs and feeling included. When I was in high school, I, I didn't really feel included. High school kind of sucked. I'm not gonna get into detail and make you guys cry, but um, the second day I was on, no, the third day I was on campus, my roommate dragged me out to the, um, what's it called? To the um, rec center. And she was going to run. And I was looking around for things to do. And there were a bunch of kids playing Cards Against Humanity. And it was, it was awesome. So I sat down and played with them. And they're still my friends to this day. So I feel, I, even though that wasn't really a club, I feel like Montclair State is a great, a great way to feel included no matter where you are, no matter where you do it or how you get to it, because you are always going to find a group of kids that maybe they're not like you, maybe they are, but either, either way, there are just so many great people on campus that you can get connected with, and all you have to do is uh, step into the door and say, hey, can I help? Or, hey, can I play with you? And you can have lifelong friendship. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Casey. And for anyone who doesn't know, this is American Sign Language for uh, clapping. Um, so I just, whenever anyone says anything, I want to make sure that you know that I'm um, thanking you and clapping for the fact that you're sharing, put yourselves out there. Um, and so another thing that I wanted to say also was, uh, Casey, you reminded me of the fact that the library, um, you know, has games um, available as well. So there's opportunities to take a break from studying in the library and have those moments to play games, uh, to learn chess and to do a number of other really cool things. I'm not sure about cards, um, but, uh, but there's quite a few things there from what I hear. And I have some really cool um, colleagues in the library who are dedicated uh, to helping students with overall wellness. So, uh, and let's see, um, Jen. Is, uh, Casey, did you have something else you wanted to say? I saw you raise your hand. Yeah, I'm sorry. I also work at the library and there's also a book club there, Ooh. which I started. So nice. <laughs> nice. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I see here that uh, that someone had asked what type of classes involve talking, um, like talking about race. So there's quite a few of them. Um, I would definitely um, invite us to let me see if I can stop sharing the screen for a second. Um, I would definitely invite us to uh, to click on our screens here. Let me just put down the, uh, hopefully the catalog um, information and then just click on, on this. So I wanted to have this available just because there's um, not only the policies and having the languages and cultures requirement, but also the, the fact that free electives can be very purposeful and that you could really find um, these areas that you really want to study and you didn't even know it was a thing. Um, I did not know that LALS, you know, Latin American Latino Studies was a thing. All of a sudden it was like, wow, I get to talk about something that I knew but just didn't have a language for academically um, or didn't have the connections for and it was just amazing. 
So as you scroll down, you see that there's a lot of different languages on campus. Uh, one of the earlier um, offices that I worked for in CHSS was uh, what's now going to be the World Cultures and Languages Department. And so every day I heard about like 11 languages a day and I got to know a little bit words here and there just because I fell in love with them. Um, and they're the, the, they're the people that organized the, the Wednesday event um, that I was part of and they had this amazing town hall and it was really, really life-changing. So um, I thank them for, you know, also putting this together. I think the philosophy department for also putting the, uh, their events together and events across campus are being helped by these amazing departments. Um, so it's not just us. Um, for the world cult culture requirement, when you keep scrolling down, you'll see their anthropology. Uh, you will see so many different types of courses and cultures explored through different ways. So there's culture and appearance, and that's through art. There's the world of dance. Um, there's different ways of looking at urban geography. Um, there's a poverty and families, that's FSHD, that's a family science and human development. Uh, there's the languages. There's so much here that talks about race. And actually, if I just find, I think that I remember seeing that if I find, if I control find, I see there is a course uh, managing diversity in the hospitality industry. So that's something that may have not been on your radar. Um, there's also diversity in business and in theater, uh, the theater uh, department has contemporary theater of cultural diversity. And I have a bestie in that program who have done something together and they're coming up with graduate uh, programs for teaching uh, diversity and inclusion through theater that will be open to anyone from any major. So if you didn't find it um, as a student here, you can definitely find it um, as a graduate student. So there's so much more. I mean, I could go on and on on these courses, but I would definitely say it is a thing. I'm glad that you asked about race. I would definitely look at our psychology of the Black experience. Uh, psychology of uh, uh, Hispanic Latino psychology, um, sociology, there's so much there, there's anthropology. I've seen so many amazing courses uh, within CHSS. That's the, those are some of the programs I know a little bit more just because of my experience with them. So I definitely say um, it's worth it. If you see something that sparks your interest, by all means, you know, we're available to talk. Um, I just want to make sure that, you know, you have time to explore and let things marinate a little bit for you. Does that answer the question? Oh, good. And let's see. I lost my chat box. Um, what a world of dance. Uh, oh, yes. So what is world of dance and is it elective or a club? So I think world of dance is actually a course. For, uh, if, we're, if you looked at this uh, at this link, it's a, it's a course, so there's also different dance clubs from what I remember with the SGA. So that's one of those nice uh, marrying of um, your time as a student in uh, what's called student affairs at the university and also academics. Uh, so I would definitely say, take a look at that. You have free electives. You have the opportunity to find yourself um, exploring those themes in those ways. Um, I did a, a diversity through um, theater uh, program recently and I hadn't done that in forever and I had never actually married those two. I had done theater but it was never about race and about uh, social justice and um, and I had just never done it in that kind of way and that was this amazing synergy and amazing immersion that I thought was just life-changing and it just made me think about things in a different way. So even as you continue knowing that you're going to learn and you're going to relearn and you're going to be open to new things, I would definitely say, take a look at it out there, combine different things. It's be very creative with it because there's definitely connections to so much. Um, oh yeah, so here we go. Sociolo so CC says, uh, taking sociology and psychology right now in human social sciences, speaking about race, interested in major psychology, working with children since I want to empower them. Um, a little shy sometimes. Don't worry, I'm shy too. I mean, why do you think I turned off the camera? Um, I'm better with one-on-one, -on -one, but you know, sometimes it's like, whoa, I'm already out there. Um, going deep into some Brene Brown vulnerability out there. You can look it up on a TED Talk, vulnerability hangover. You'll, you'll love Brene Brown. She's cool. Um, let's see here. How do you sign up for intramurals in MSU? That's a great question. Um, I'm going to have to get back to you on that one because I don't 100%. I already sent the link, Melissa. Hmm? We answered a lot of CeCe's questions. Oh, good. Oh, good. So where are we now then? Just because I feel like I'm... Oh, good. 
anyone else have any other questions or comments? CC, I love it. It seems like you're on your game, especially still being a high school student. That's awesome. And you know what? I'm going to put Melissa's contact information in the chat for you so you can reach out to her after for, for a one-on-one -on -one also. Thank you. you asked, yeah, you were asking student like questions like as if you were a student. I was like, what year are you in? It's like, you're in high school? I'm a senior, yeah. Oh, wow. Are you joining us in the fall? Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Now you know who's going to send you those emails. And anything else? Anyone else here? Um, I don't want to take up too much more time because I'm, I'm afraid of going over time. And I'm chatty, if you haven't noticed. Uh, so anyone else, anything else, anything come up when you thought about it in the big and little ways? Like, um, you know, would you go to a club where you were guaranteed to be the majority? Would you go as a minority? Like, what would you do in the everyday to change like a little habit to make diversity, inclusion, social justice more a part of your weekly conversation or things that you prioritize? Mm -hmm. All right, looks like everyone's getting quiet. I don't know if people are refreshing their coffees or not, but since we're on the student piece, I figured, are there any other students that are here that would like to give any other input or information, not just to CC as an incoming student, but any of those that are already students here may not know the options? Go ahead, Casey, I see you. Hi, um, first of all, CC, that's so great that you're here. Um, I just feel like the best advice I could give you as an incoming student is to literally join whatever you can. If you see, I don't know, like some club, join that. If you see another club, join, join that. Like if it catches your interest, even for a second, join it because you could get lifelong friends, lifelong experiences. You never know who you're going to meet. You never know what you're going to learn. You never know what you're going to learn about yourself along the way. So I just think that getting involved if, as, whenever you can, whoever you can, is the best thing that you could do as a new student. Don't be in too big of a rush also. I would say like take your, take your time with that a little bit because it will be new to you. And even though you'll be super excited, you wanna make sure that, um, you know, that you create a schedule that I think holistically works for you, that you build in some times for wellness. I think that's where psychology comes in. I've never thought about wellness as much as I've done this year. So there definitely has to be moments where we build in renewal and time to, you know, time to grieve and time to take just time, um, time to figure out what's evidence-based and what are some real actionable steps. Um, I told a friend that I met at Montclair uh, this weekend, I said, I said, you need to give yourself a moment where you're not expecting yourself to be okay with what's going on. Don't feel guilty about it but don't stay at the sidelines either. So I hope that there are moments where you can safely feel that you can come and do something. And if you can't, that's okay to feel. Uh, Milton, you wanna mention the multicultural psychology clubs? I saw you put the link there, but you wanna say a few words about the, mm -hmm. what's, what is happening there? Sure. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll be connecting with you all at 1045 to talk about implicit bias and how to understand it and, uh, and respond to it. Looking forward to that conversation. But I've been advising the Multicultural Psychology uh, Scholars Club for a little over 10 years now. We just celebrated 10 years this year and uh, we, we were planning a big party but the pandemic uh, took that plan away, but hopefully we'll be able to plan something soon. Uh, it's a club within the, within the psychology department that looks at the intersection between multiculturalism and psychology. Um, so it's almost like a, a multicultural psychology club. And uh, we typically meet on Wednesdays during the common hour. And when uh, a lot of the other clubs went, uh, went silent uh, during the pandemic, we remained alive and well. We offered several programs in the spring to just remain connected with you. I was really proud of the student executive board who kind of remain connected with all of you. So check us out. I put it in the chat box. Um, you could visit our website or you can connect with us uh, through Facebook or other uh, 
other social media platforms. So we look forward to connecting with you. Thanks for uh, highlighting that, Yola. Mm -hmm. And I see here that CC says that you have some friends from high school that are also coming with you to MSU. So you have a couple of, couple of peeps coming along. By all means, invite them on over. Psychology doesn't have to be their program. If that's not their jam, uh, we can always, uh, you know, there's always a psychology course that can be taken for a general education, especially psychology of leadership um, and psychology of the Black experience. And Casey, we won't know until late July what's going on in the fall on campus. I see that you put that question in for the fall. We have no idea if we're still going to be remote or in person or half and half, some sort of hybrid mix. Um, we're waiting for the Department of Education to make some decisions and then every college campus will make their own decisions as well. So unfortunately, you guys are in the same boat as us because we don't know either. So hopefully within the next month or so, everyone will know something. So you could tell all your friends that too. Don't ask us, we don't know either, unfortunately. Um, I can say that um, there is a real effort to uh, incoming freshmen will have a campus experience. There's, there's a real effort that is being made. Uh, we know students want it. Uh, it's complicated. There's a lot of uh, health and safety issues involved with that. Uh, but uh, there is effort that, that is made right now to, uh, to provide students, especially incoming freshmen, with, uh, uh, with a campus experience. I also want to highlight uh, another event that the psych department is involved with uh, that is coming up, uh, somewhat related, psychology of immigration. Um, we are planning a workshop uh, down the line. Um, it might be on Zoom, I hear, uh, as well. And um, you know that immigration is another immigrant, is an, another group of people who are exposed to uh, oppression and discrimination. Um, so um, uh, stay tuned for announcement about, uh, about that workshop. It's not going to be immediate. Some, some planning needs to be done yet. And it's probably going to be virtual. It wasn't supposed to be virtual, but that virus has really scrambled the cards for us. Uh, uh, but. Uh, the advantage of, um, of, of uh, virtual conferences is that it's uh, cheaper. Uh, you don't have to pay for food and, and, and space and people can join from all over. So, um, so that's coming up. And uh, we, we also offer uh, uh, inside the course, psychology of uh, 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 Hispanic and, and Latino, we offer psychology of immigration in that, in that course as well. So, uh, so stay tuned. Um, Melissa, anything else uh, coming up? I mean, we, we, the next uh, presentation is going to be at, uh, at, uh, at 10.45. Now it's 10.33. Um, but uh, you, 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 uh, we are here. You guys can ask any questions that you want to ask. Um, we, I want to keep it to the schedule. I don't want to you know, get it earlier because people are probably planning to, to join it at certain times. So um, we definitely are open for questions. And uh, hi, Paul. Uh, and, and, uh, and comments for everyone. I mean. You know, uh, uh, those are crazy times and we like to share and you, you can share with us any questions, any comment on anything that, uh, that you like. Melissa? Um, I would, I echo that definitely. We can talk about what you'd like. I, I put some stuff out there just to let you know that I understand and uh, we're all making our path as we continue learning. And um, I would just invite you to you know, to feel free to share what you would like to share either now or privately, uh, but definitely explore those questions because you never know what is actually research, uh, what's something that someone's studying and you could just be following, you know, a general curiosity and find a whole new career and be like, whoa, that's a thing. Um, kind of like John Oliver, how is this still a thing? Well, it's like sometimes things are, are good things um, and they may just be that they're in an academic article that you have to take a look at and um, just have that built in into, in terms of the time that you give your studies. But it's definitely um, an amazing opportunity and I am so incredibly grateful. Like another thing that I don't share too often, but I figure it will. Um, I, like I had this moment with all of the, I mean, this, this year has been a decade. Like it's felt like a decade, um, whole mood right there. And so I had a moment where I was like, oh my gosh, what if I get sick? What if something happens? Like. And then had a moment where I was like, I'm so glad I changed careers because I had to just turn it around. I had to look for a silver lining. I had to think about gratitude. And I was just like, 
I'm so glad I changed careers. And for a while there, that was like the only thing that I could really be certain of, that things were uncertain. There was a lot going on. My parents live in a different state. They're older. There's so much stuff. I'm not going to go into it. Uh, but for a moment there, that was all that I could say to myself at the end of the day. I'm so glad that I did this. I'm so glad that I'm part of this. Uh, I'm so glad that I'm also looking into my own higher education and continuing on with the graduate program that, that I've embraced that, that students are teaching me every day. So thank you for that. And I want to I want to mention one more thing for students here that uh, you know one of the strength of our department is that uh, we have a lot of uh, active faculty who are doing research and they're always looking for students to join the labs undergrad students as well as graduate students but undergrad students uh, to help in research and you're going to hear some of this research here today and I hope you stay with us uh, after this session you're going to hear some of it by Dr Fuentes uh, and uh, Dr Graffin and uh, and Jasmine. Uh, um, and um, one of the ways that you can connect to, to social justice initiative is to join a lab with a professor who's looking into this, uh, those issues and in no time you can find yourself presenting a poster or talking on those issues. Um, for example, unequal, unequal access to mental health uh, in schools. You think about that for a second. Um, uh, different school district, different school, different population within schools have a, 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 a different a, a access to, um, to mental health, which causes problems and outcomes that affect learning and later their ability to join us here. So if you look into that, what causes those, those, those different access? How can we um, fix that? Can we use a, a social media and digital uh, means to uh, alert people to all kinds of possibilities and resources that, that mental health professionals uh, have, you know. So all this is evidence-based. It's not just, you know, I want to do something, I'll do it. There's evidence-based, there's research, there's data collection, there's presentation, there's papers. Um, and I, I hope the next time we do that, um, and we will do it the next time, the, you're going to see some students presenting. Uh, we, have, we have a very successful PhD program and another one coming up and hopefully those students will be uh, talking as well next time about their involvement in research. So, um, you know, beyond the clubs and the, the social activities, um, you can actually uh, join a lab that deals with social just justice and discrimination issues and be actually research active. So, um, I just want to add that to the mix. Yes. Definitely. That's that's everything right there. That's everything right there. That's a connection. I really wish I had done that part. Uh, so, uh, I mean, we still have five minutes until our next presentation. So if, you know, don't go anywhere, don't change the channel. <sighs> Commercial break. We are here in five minutes. Uh, we're going to hear from Dr. Fuentes. So uh, that's great. But you, you, can, you can talk. Thank you so much for inviting me, Melissa. Um, I, I have to go. I'm watching my siblings today, so I could only make the early morning one. I've corralled them upstairs, and they're not going to stay upstairs much longer. So oh, thank you so much. No, thank you for joining us. Thank you for all that you shared, uh, for being so active on campus. Um, and you might have heard my cat make some noise before, so no worries. Like We're all coming live from our living rooms, so huh. yeah, siblings. Um, and keep persisting. I would say to any student, keep persisting. Um, this is about the long game. This is about continuing to make this a thing. So you don't have to do it all today. Enjoy. Thank you so much, Casey. Thank you. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye. All right. So at 10.45, uh, our next speaker and the first in the series of the uh, evidence-based presentation and the things that our faculty uh, do and we hope to communicate uh, to you today is, um, is Dr. Milton Fuentes. He's a professor of psychology, coordinator of uh, advising, is running the Multicultural Psychology Club. And he's going to talk uh, today on uh, understanding and addressing implicit bias. So take it away. Great. Thank you, Dr. Aria. And thank you, everybody, for, for joining me this morning. Um, in addition to being a professor in the psych department, 
I'm also a licensed psychologist in New Jersey, New York, and I'm a member of the uh, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Collaborative that comes out of the American Psychological Association. So very quickly, I just want to share some, um, some remarks around uh, my presentation today. First, as, as you can probably deduce by the title, it's a very timely topic. I want to share very quickly what the current thinking in the field is around uh, training folks in, around this topic. Uh, at first, folks, you know, just tried to offer lots of information to people in a real didactic approach. Here's a lot of information and that might change you. And the research quickly found that that wasn't very effective. Uh, and then folks tried to engage uh, individuals in a, in a series of exercises that uh, what the hope was that they would also move people in, in, a, in the right direction. And the research also found that that wasn't effective. Uh, the answer, quite honestly, is, is, is somewhere in the middle. Um, we do need the right information so we can process it and make the, the appropriate connection. And so we do need to give you that information. And we also need to, to, to make sense of it, uh, think about how it, how it relates to us and, and our field. And that's the experiential part. <clears throat> some research, some interesting research has revealed that uh, sometimes when we do bias reduction training, it could actually lead to more bias because folks feel like uh, they've gotten the training and uh, they don't need to worry about their, their biases as they make decisions or interact with others. So we want to be mindful of that dynamic as well. Uh, I've been given 30 minutes to chat with you about implicit bias, uh, so that's that's a tall task. Uh, we want to be careful with this uh, one, in, one and done mentality, right? Oh, I did the training, I'm okay now. Uh, this is an ongoing process. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm 51 right now, and so there's been 51 years of socialization, and it's gonna take time uh, to unsocialize or undo a lot of the messages that I've received about individuals in society and that I've internalized. So obviously 35 minutes is just uh, a, an opportunity to introduce you to something and I'm hoping that it will allow you to, to uh, continue this important conversation with yourself and with others. The stuff, uh, what we have found is that uh, when we do this stuff, it does involve a reflection or within ourselves, some intrapersonal reflections. We do need to start with ourselves. Um, and of course, it does involve interactions with others, so some interpersonal uh, interactions as well. Um, I do realize that I'm speaking to a very diverse audience, a uh, very heterogeneous audience. And so folks are in very, very different places in terms of their own uh, sociocultural awareness. And so I just want to acknowledge that um, and think through some of the topics I'm about to talk about today and how that connects to where you are. And I just want to end with um, with the fact that some of this stuff is is sensitive and it could cause us to feel not only physical distress but psychological distress. Uh, Professor Jackson, African American psych, uh, psychologist at the University of uh, Michigan, has alerted us to to this finding, and so we just want to be mindful as I introduce stuff to you. Take care of yourself over the next 35 minutes. Think about what you need to do to take care of yourself. I turn to mindfulness. I'm feeling my feet on the ground right now. I may take a few cleansing breaths um, throughout the, the next uh, 30 minutes just to kind of take good care of myself and I invite you to do the same. <clears throat> I wanna engage you a little bit in this conversation. So what I want you to do now is, if you can, go to uh, menti.com, uh, www.menti.com on your smartphone or on your computer and it's going to ask for a code. So once you get there, www.menti.com, it's going to ask you for a code. Go ahead and put that code in, 828331. And I'm going to go ahead and activate that right now. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to share with us a value that matters to you. And while you're doing that, I am going to share my screen so that you can see what folks are saying about what matters to them. Hopefully you can see this. Several of you are participating. Thank you for that. And just something about menti.com, as the words get bigger, that means that uh, several folks in this group are sharing um, a value. So we've got honesty, 
as a value that's being shared by several of you in this group, self-awareness, being kind, open-mindedness, compassion, genuineness. I love this exercise because it really uh, excites me to know what folks are, uh, what folks value, what's important to you. And so I'm gonna move away from the screen. Um, during this time right now, we are having some really important conversations. That's a um, website. And thank you. And it's, it's heartening to know um, what, what matters to you all. Um, and uh, the reason I like doing this exercise is because um, sometimes, let me just see if I can find my, my screen here. There we are. Um, it's, a, it's really important for me to, to do this exercise because sometimes uh, we, we do things uh, that, that might compromise our values. Uh, sometimes our implicit biases might compromise our values. Uh, there's some good research around just being clear about our values. Um, there's something about articulating our values that uh, enhances our sense of self-efficacy and makes us feel more competent, more present. And so that, that's an important uh, exercise to do as well. Just some fun and interesting facts about me very quickly. And, I, and I'm going to tell you why I'm doing this in a second. Um, I, uh, I listened to a podcast a few years ago on the habits of successful people. And if you have access to the chat box, go ahead and type in there, what do you think is the first thing a successful person does? And I realize the term successful is somewhat subjective, but whatever it means to you. But what do you think is the first thing a successful person does? Go ahead and type that in the chat box. Let's see what folks uh, share. And if you have a chance, go ahead and take a look at what folks are saying. Yolanda, it's good to see you. Thanks for joining me. Hi, Jennifer. Good to see you. Awesome. Thanks, folks. Thanks for participating. What, we, what I learned in this podcast is the first thing successful people, people do in the morning is they make their bed. Uh, some folks argue that's so that they can experience an immediate sense of accomplishment, which sets the tone for the rest of the day. Some people argue that it's because after a really rough day, it's good to come home to a nicely made bed. And that's a nice experience. The next thing they do after that is they meditate. Um, I meditate for 10 minutes uh, every day after I make my bed. I actually do two things right away. While my coffee is brewing, I make my bed. And so I have two immediate sense, uh, two immediate accomplishments, a brewed cup of coffee and a, a made, made bed. So two immediate things. And then I meditate for 10, 10 minutes. I've been doing that for a little over two years now. It has made such a difference. Uh, and then the third thing they do is they, they reflect on uh, their, their goals, their personal and professional goals, and they think about two or three things they're going to get done that day that they promise to get done that day that connect, connects their bigger goals. Um, my, the latest book that I'm, I'm reading right now is called How, How Not to Die by Michael Greger. Uh, it's on, on veganism, on adopting a plant-based diet, which I've been doing for over six months now. Guilty pleasure, anything related to National Public Radio, although I have been shying away from, from media lately. Um, I do love Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, a great show on NPR. Uh, I'm a former half marathon runner, completed my sixth run two years ago. Um, I'm one of eight, I'm number seven of eight. And my first name is Milton. I wish there was an interesting story behind that. By the time my parents got to me, number seven, they had named six other kids already. Uh, so my mom said she turned to a calendar, and for whatever reason, the month of May was associated with the name of Milton, and that's how I got named, Milton. Um, it is an English name. It means destined for, for success, so that is quite the namesake that my parents have uh, imposed on me or awarded me, if you will. Um, this, this activity that I'm engaging right now is called individuation, and I'm going to talk about this in a little bit, uh, but... People might hear my name, Milton Fuentes, Dr. Fuentes, Professor Fuentes, and some of you might get very excited by my, by, by my Latinx sounding surname, and some of you will make some assumptions about me. And some of you might think that I might not have anything worthwhile to offer. But, but by engaging in this activity called individuation, you may not connect with me uh, because of my Latinx background. I'm actually Puerto Rican. Um, you may not connect with me around that, 
but you may connect with me around some of the stuff I just mentioned, and that might make you receptive to uh, this conversation that we're going to have. And so this is called individuation, and I'm going to go into that in a little bit, but I want to just I'll show you what, what that looks like. Moving along here, folks. Just really quickly, in terms of our conversation today, this is in pro, in pro, our, managing our implicit biases, understanding our implicit biases is, is very important to inter, intercultural competence. That is developing a set of cognitive, affective, and behavioral skills and characteristics that support effective and appropriate interactions in a variety of cultural contexts. And so we're trying to get folks to develop intercultural competence in various places, whether it be in the, on the police force, whether it be in the classroom, uh, wherever it might be, employers are looking for folks who have intercultural competence. And I just want to show you a quick visual what that continuum looks like. Uh, where might we be? Where might you be in terms of your own intercultural competence? Uh, do you miss differences? Do you judge differences? Do you de-emphasize differences? Um, or do you just do you, do you recognize differences in a deeper way and do you try to build bridges across those differences? And so this is just a quick visual of what intercultural competence uh, looks like. I want to share this, this quote with you very quickly. Between what I think I want to say, what I believe I'm saying, what I say, what you want to hear, what you believe you understand, what you understand, there are at least nine possibilities for misunderstanding. And if you're having the same conversations that I'm having today with family and friends on email, on listservs, this probably resonates for you. Uh, there are so many misunderstandings going on out there right now, and it really is disheartening to see that we have lost our ability to communicate in an effective way. If we miscommunicate, we find ourselves uh, defriending uh, our, our, our friends. Um, and it's just very disheartening that we've lost the ability to, to connect, connect and communicate in an effective way. Let's get to the heart of the presentation, implicit bias. Banaji and Greenwald, two well-known scholars around implicit bias, basically say that an implicit bias is a hidden preference for one identity over another. So if, when, when we look at implicit bias, some of us will prefer certain races over another. Some of us will prefer certain skin color tones over others. Some of us will prefer certain sex or gender expressions over others. Some of us will uh, prefer sexual orientation or ability over others. I know I'm living, leaving out some identity factors, but we, are, uh, we, we have been socialized to prefer some things over others. And that process is in that quote, that quote right there. Implicit bias involves traces of past experience that affects some performance, even though the influential earlier experience is not remembered in the usual sense. Um, so things are happening. We're being socialized to prefer some things over others. Here's what we know about implicit bias. They are unconscious and automatic. They're pervasive. We all have them. They don't necessarily adhere to what we actually believe. So we might believe uh, that we're not a sexist. We might believe that we're not a racist. We might believe that we're not homophobic um, explicitly, but they, our implicit biases may not necessarily adhere to what we, what we think we, we believe. They have real world effects. Uh, they affect us in terms of employment, healthcare, legal matters, education. Uh, however, they are malleable. Uh, there is some research that suggests that they can be unlearned and we can substitute them with new mental associations or unbiased responses. If you want to know more about implicit biases, I want to direct you to the Kerwin, Kerwin Institute, which is, releases a wonderful report every year around implicit biases. Uh, there's a, a cousin to implicit biases, uh, and those are microaggressions. It's a byproduct. Of, of implicit biases. You may have learned about my, my, microaggressions in your psychology courses. They are brief and commonplace daily verbal, nonverbal, and environmental slights, insults, invalidations, and indignities. Uh, Sue out at Columbia has written extensively about microaggressions. Um, and I've got lots of links in here to allow you to continue this work. I don't know if we'll have time to do that today, um, but I do want to share. Um, Several, several links with you so that you can check out 
uh, one, all these links. And this one is, is where are you from? Which is a, a question we'll ask people who live in this country who don't look like us. We'll ask them where they're from. And the, and the subtext there oftentimes is, you're not from here, you don't belong here. Um, and so I want you to check out this, this, this clip so you can get a, a deeper understanding of what, what it means to say to people, uh, where are you from? I oftentimes will get the where are you from question and I will ask people, where do you think I'm from? And I'll get Italian and I'll get uh, Greek and I'll get uh, Middle Eastern. Um, sometimes I'll get Cuban. I never get Puerto Rican for some reason. And when I ask, uh, when I say to folks I'm Puerto Rican, they'll, they'll oftentimes say, uh, you, don't, you don't look Puerto Rican. And I've been to Puerto Rican, uh, Puerto Rico lot, lots of times um, and there are a lot of people who look like me. Um, and sometimes I'll say to them, I don't look like Ricky Martin. I don't look like Jennifer Lopez. I don't look like Mark Anthony. And in saying that to folks, um, I help to highlight that Puerto Ricans look very different. I, you know, there are very different types of Puerto Ricans. But for some reason, they have a Puerto Rican type in their head, an implicit bias, if you will, about what a Puerto Rican looks like. So I want you to visit this link and check it out when you get a chance. I'll be ha happy to share all these links with you in a little bit and also to share this PowerPoint with you. Moving on really quickly, as I mentioned, the good news is that um, implicit biases orientations can be unlearned. And what I want to share with you is um, a prejudice habit breaking intervention that Devon and colleagues developed. Um, it involves a 12-week study that introduced folks to eight weeks of particular evidence-based interventions for developing, uh, for reducing race-based biases. And they involve these strategies right here. Um, so really quickly, that's just a quick visual of what the study looked like. And then uh, other folks did a follow-up study to uh, Patricia Devine's original study and some interesting stuff came out. Uh, folks who participated in these interventions were more likely to interact with black strangers and that becomes very important a little bit. Uh, they were more likely to report noticing bias and to label it as wrong, take some sort of action. Two years later, they were more likely to confront a bias if they, if they found it. And in terms of uh, the strategies I'm about to introduce to you, um, I want you to keep a couple things in mind. Um, because we've been socialized over our lives to believe certain things, we need to recognize that in order to do this well, it's going to involve ongoing effort. Um, we need to recognize that the more we use these strategies, the easier they will become. And we also need to recognize that these strategies are interrelated. So the more I have contact with people who are different than me, the more I can get to know them as an individual, so that leads to individuation. The more I get to know them as an, individu as an individual, the more I understand their perspective, the more I understand what it might mean to be X, what it might mean to be Y, which allows me to do perspective taking. And so these are all interrelated and they inform each other. So let's get to these uh, strategies. The first one is we need to, if we wanna understand our biases, we need to bring awareness to them. And one way that we can do that is by visiting this web, website, Project Implicit, which allows us to understand our biases in a number of areas, including race, ethnicity, gender, disability, age, sexuality, weight, and, and, and skin color. My research is around skin color, um, because sometimes we talk about uh, folks who are black and folks who are white and folks who are Latinx, but Latinx folks can be white or black. We, we have a medley of uh, racial backgrounds, and oftentimes we forget about that in the research. And so some of our research is getting, trying to get researchers or convince researchers to consider measuring skin color as an identity variable in their research. But if you want to know uh, what your biases are, this is for this website. Take a couple of the implicit bias tests to learn more about your biases. Once you've brought awareness to your bias, then we want to engage in what's called stereotype replacement. Basically, this involves replacing stereotypical responses with non-stereotypical responses. First, it involves recognizing that we're having a bias response, labeling it as a bias response, reflecting on why we're having this response, 
and consider ways that we can avoid this response in the future. So what, what you want to do is you want to think about how you can use this in, in your day-to-day -day interactions. So if I'm, if I'm driving in the car and, I, and somebody frustrates me and I look over as I'm driving and I see them and I see who they are, their gender, their color, and I have some thoughts come into my head uh, that might be biased, uh, a biased response, this is a good opportunity to stop and pause and engage in what's called stereotype replacement. The other thing we can think of is what's called counter stereotypic imaging. Basically, we want to imagine in detail counter stereotypical others. So if we have a thought about uh, a particular race, or we, for example, when, I, when, somebody, when people say to me, but you don't, you don't look Puerto Rican, right? They have a thought about what a Puerto Rican looks like. So what they want to do is I help them engage. When I, when I give them that response, I help them engage in what's called counter stereotypic imaging. I give them examples of what other Puerto Ricans might look like so they can broaden their understanding of what a Puerto Rican looks like. So if you have a thought about what a gay person looks like or acts like, then think about other gay folks that you know who may not fit your stereotype. And you want to broaden your understanding of that particular category, that particular identity factor. The other strategy is individuation, um, getting specific information about group members so that we can learn to evaluate them on personal factors rather than group-based factors or group-based attributes. So when I shared fun facts about me, I help individuate myself to you so that when you have immediate associations to Fuentes, now you can have other associations to Fuentes. And that might lead to us connecting in a different meaningful way. These are just, uh, what I'm bypassing here is I'm bypassing uh, just other things that you can do, because I want to make sure I leave time for questions. Um, other things that you can do to engage in, um, in these strategies. The, the, the second to last strategy, strategy is perspective taking. So trying to take the the first person perspective of what it might be like to be a member of a stereotype group. So what must it be like to be, um, to be black in America, right? What might, might that experience be like? I know that as a light skinned Puerto Rican, I have skin color privilege. So when I walk into a store and somebody says to me, can I help you? They really want to help me. The subtext is not, uh, I know you're there and I'm monitoring you, right? When I go buy a home in a community, um, people will allow me to live in that community because of my skin color privilege. If I try to hail a taxi, a taxi will stop for me because of my skin color privilege. What must it be like to ha not have that skin color privilege and, and have all the experiences that, you're, that, those, that folks are having uh, in society? So having some perspective on that helps increase our psychological closeness to the stigmatized group and helps ameliorate our automatic group-based evaluations of that group. And then the last strategy is having contact with folks who are different than us. Um, that, this, is an, this, is, this was all, all port social psychologists. This is an old strategy, uh, but, but we tend to shy away from it. And if you look at Claude Steele's work, he wrote a great book called Whistling Vivaldi. Um, people are afraid to talk to people who are different than them because they're afraid to say the wrong thing. And that's called identity threat. And what Claude Steele says, African-American scholar has done some great work. Um, what he says is we have to give ourselves permission to mess up, to mess up in these conversations. Remember, it's not anybody else's job to educate us. We have to educate ourselves. So we can't turn to, to the folks who we would deem to be the other and ask them to educate us. That's not their job. It's our job to educate ourselves. And at the same time, um, we have to realize that some of these conversations are difficult. We're going to mess up. That's okay. Uh, just be willing to learn from that mess up. Um, inform ourselves from that mess up 
and continue the dialogue. Um, so this, this is just a self-reflection exercise that integrates all of these um, exercises. And these are just some of the resources. A lot of what I just said is in this book called The Blind Spot by Banaji and Greenwald, uh, written for, for folks out there, lay folks, so please consider checking it out. Uh, as we do this work, let's make sure we take care of ourselves. This work can be taxing psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, personally, and professionally. So let's make sure we're taking care of ourselves. This is just a little self-care wheel. Um, and I just want you to pause for a second. We've got four minutes. Um, as a result of what you just heard in the chat box, what might you be willing to do? Go ahead and put that in the chat box. What might you be willing to do now as a result of what you just heard? in these uh, 25 minutes. While you do that, I want to just scroll some other bot, some other resources that I'm sharing with you. If you can just share in the chat box things you might be willing to do. And I'm just going to pause here, and I'm happy to take any questions you have or comments you have in our next uh, three minutes. I'm seeing some great stuff, some great comment in here. Thank you, folks. You're going. You're. Uh, you're really uh, putting some great things in here. The, the more specific you can be uh, and the more public you can be around your commitment, the greater your chance of engaging in this behavior that you want to en engage in. So be as specific as possible. Tell somebody uh, that you're, you plan on doing something and ask them to hold you accountable. And that will lead to, to true uh, behavioral change. Thank you folks for, for participating. Anybody have a comment or a question? I know I'm I'm on this call with, with some social psychologists, so I feel a, li a little bit of a, like, a, like an imposter here. Um, so I, I welcome Dr. Collins or Dr. Wilson to, to fill in the, uh, the blanks here if I missed something or if I misrepresented something. I find myself being like a closet social psychologist sometimes when I do my research. Anybody, got a, anybody wanna raise their hand or ask a question? Jen, any questions in the chat box that you can highlight? Nothing yet. Everyone's giving other suggestions. Awesome. Anybody uh, want to share? So what I'm going to do now, folks, uh, between between now and uh, the the next presentation, which is 10 minutes, I'm going to cut and paste all the links from my presentation. I'll put them in the chat box so you can uh, have access to them. But I see uh, some great specific presentations here. The one thing we want to keep in mind, folks, is um, remember, it's been, however old you are, it's been years of socialization. Uh, this stuff's not going to work. Uh, it's not going to, 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 to turn around overnight. It does require ongoing effort on our part, deliberately and strategically. Thanks for your time. Thank, to, thank you, Dr. Aria and colleagues and, and folks for joining me. And I look forward to the next presentation in 10 minutes. Take good care. Thank you, uh, thank you, Milton. I mean, we still have time. Our next presentation um, is actually at 11.30, according to the schedule. So we still have time for questions. And um, if people want to share anything regarding implicit bias, experiences that they had with themselves or others, um, question for Dr. Fuentes, that's, uh, we still have the time to do that. And, uh, you know, uh, I think it was a very interesting presentation, a lot of information, but uh, it's a start. So uh, thank you, Milton. My pleasure. Yeah, I'm happy to listen to, to thoughts or perspectives or question, answer any questions.
Thank you, Dr. Wilson, for highlighting there. Uh, you wanted to, us to, to note that um, one thing I would add is that training ourselves out of bias does not necessarily need to be implicit. There is great value in considering comprehensive approaches to bias reduction. Recognizing our implicit bias is one important part of the overall approach. Thank you for that, Dr. Wilson. Dr. Fuentes, did you mention another book besides The Blind Spot? Uh, Whistling Vivaldi by Claude Steele. Uh, wonderful book. Highly recommend it uh, if you want to check it out. Great, great ideas for helping us have productive and meaningful conversations around race in this country. Um, also, there's a, I just uh, listened to um, a great webinar around white fragility. So I know that book's getting a lot of attention as well. So if you want to uh, check out that, that book, also a worthwhile read. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. He just added it to the chat box. So for, for faculty who are um, on the call or, or students, you know, one thing that I try to do in the classroom is I try to blind grade. Um, so I do a, a blind grading. So whenever students are assigned a number in my class, so when I, um, I get to know them as individuals and by name, because they always put a nameplate in front of themselves. Um, but whenever they hand me something, it's always a number and it's, the number is always in the back. And so I grade everything blind. I try to grade everything blindly and I try to create a rubric uh, because I have my biases and, uh, you know, my, your, your identity profile should not affect how I, how I grade you, how I evaluate you. And so um, I have a rubric and I don't know whose work I'm grading. And so I look at everything and, and I try to evaluate the work that way as, as objectively as possible. So that's one way I, um, I, I monitor my biases in the classroom. I also try to take a look at who I'm calling on and why I'm calling on them and um, who I'm, who I'm uh, validating in the classroom. Do I have a tendency to validate certain students over others? Do I validate, uh, uh, pardon the, the, the gender non-inclusiveness, but if I, do I you know, value more kind of what I, what I deem to be more physically male individuals versus female individuals? Um, am I validating students of color more? So lots of dynamics in the classroom that I need to be mindful of. Um, and am I monitoring my implicit biases around there? Lots of great uh, resources being shared by our colleagues. Thank you, Dr. Simonette, for that resource. So some good stuff there. Thank you. Well, I'm going to give you time to process and think. Um, I'm going to take this time to go ahead and, uh, and, and pop all these resources in the chat box. If you email me um, at fuentesm.monclair.edu, I will gladly share a copy of this presentation with you. All righty, folks. I'll let you go grab some coffee um, or whatever beverage you like. And I see Dr. Collins in the screen. Dr. Collins, good to see you. Good morning. All righty. I'll catch you all a little bit. Looking forward to listening to Dr. Reyes Portillo's uh, presentation in a little bit. Thanks, uh, thanks again, Milton. So um, it's 11.20, we got a, <clears throat> a short break to, uh, to get some coffee and uh, the next presentation by, by, by Dr. Reyes Portillo is gonna start at 11.30. So um, I will in introduce her then and uh, we'll continue this. Uh, it was very interesting, continue this interesting conversation. Thank you. So uh, yeah, thanks for asking me to participate in this, this day of conversations. Um, uh, and thanks to everyone who has already given uh, really interesting talks. I'm going to be talking about some research um, that I think can can help to inform kind of the uh, the experience that that kind of we in society are going through right now. Um, there are lots of ways to think about um, about these events, people's reactions, uh, people's actions out there on the streets from a historical lens, a sociological lens. Um, I'm, I'm a social psychologist, so I'm specifically going to be kind of talking about some research from 
the area of social psychology. So um, just to, to get started here, I'm, I'm going to kind of back up to a, a different time point that wasn't so long ago that, you know, I think in many ways kind of started us down the road of this, this modern movement. Um, in 2012, uh, Trayvon Martin, pictured here, was, was shot and killed by a community member in his neighborhood um, while walking around. This happened in Florida. Um, not long after that, um, a couple years later, actually, Michael Brown was shot and killed by a white police officer in Ferguson, Missouri. And then very soon after that, Tamir Rice, a 12-year-old boy, was shot and killed um, by a Cleveland uh, City police officer while playing with a toy gun um, in a park near his home. And these were certainly not uh, the first police killings of, of unarmed black men and boys in our country, but they, they struck a nerve and I think kind of spurred this, this new mo uh, movement for our current generation. Um, these killings and many others, um, Eric Garner, Alton Sterling, Orlando Castile, Laquan McDonald, Sandra Bland, Walter Scott, Terrence Crutcher, um, and now in 2020, skipping many, several years now, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery, in addition to people who have continued to be tragically killed in the context of protests uh, of those deaths um, and the police actions in, in those deaths. All of these deaths have led people to feel compelled to declare explicitly and simply that Black Lives Matter. Um, so this, this is kind of this movement that um, so many of us are, um, are paying attention to, are participating in. Um, and it, so it became this really kind of bona fide social movement um, not really necessarily a centralized one, but with many individual local chapters all over the U.S. Um, and Black Lives Matter protesters um, became known for speaking out against disparities in the criminal justice system and police behavior, but also about things like economic injustice. Um, in fact, it's a multifaceted and uh, or a sort of organization or collective that takes an intersectional approach with a focus on including voices of people who have tended to be marginalized in discussions of race and, and gender focused social justice. Um, so that's a, a kind of broad context for, um, for sort of part of, of this movement that's happening in society right now. I am I'm gonna actually kind of try to take a narrower focus, but with hopes of sort of shedding light on things um, related to, to these movements. Um, and so really kind of today specifically, I'm gonna kind of be talking a little bit about how psychology and specifically social psychology can inform this movement. Um, I'm going to start with kind of just some data that sort of um, help to frame this, this problem and this discussion, things that many of you are, are very well aware of, I think, at this point. Um, so one thing that we know is that there are disparities in how communities are policed. Um, lots of, uh, of, there are lots of data that show this from different cities around, uh, around the country and North America. Um, one thing that we know is that black people make up a disproportionate share of police stops. Um, whether you're talking about stop and frisk in New York City, uh, where between 2004 and, and 2012, black people made up 52% of police stop and frisks, um, even though they make up much less than 52% of the, of the population of the city. If you look at Boston, another city, we have very similar data. On the right pie chart, you can see that black people make up about a quarter of Boston's population, but they make up about, um, or made up about two thirds of uh, police civilian encounters between 2007 and, and 2010. So again and again and again, you can look at data like this um, that shed light on uh, who is being stopped by police, who is having to have these encounters with, conversations with, and uh, uh, sort of encounters that have the potential for escalation with police officers in their cities. Um, of course, we also have data about uh, who is killed by police. This is just one particular graph um, from 2012, but you can look at similar data from 2015, 2018, 2019, basically in a year, showing that black Americans make up a disproportionate share of those who are killed by police. And the bottom part of this graph shows that this disparity is even sort of larger um, when they are not attacking. So among people who are unarmed or are not attacking otherwise, um, black people tend to be uh, much more heavily targeted in these police killings than, um, than non-black people. And so, um, you know, this, this brings up a lot of, uh, a lot of questions. Um, one thing that is inherent in these is the idea of threat. Police officers are authorized to use force in situations in which, quote, a reasonable bystander would judge that force was necessary to protect their life. 
basically, did you feel that this person is threatening to you? And this idea of, of black threat is central to many of the questions that social psychologists have, have posed over the last several decades. Um, so we're thinking about what is it about, you know, you know, that links blackness and threat in the minds of people, um, white people, but not just uh, white people. Uh, and really here specifically in the United States, although um, you could look at Canada as well and see much of the same happening and all over the world. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the research that social psychologists have been doing really for decades now. Um, so this idea is, is not new. I pictured here is, is Dr. Claude Steele, who Dr. Fuentes already mentioned um, earlier today. Dr. Steele wrote of this experience of what he called whistling Vivaldi in order to deflect a threat stereotype. This story actually came from a friend of his who was a fellow black man who went to grad school at the University of Chicago in the early 1970s. Um, this man basically knew that people saw him as a threat and he decided upon a strategy to deflect this stereotype. Uh, he would learn to walk around whistling Vivaldi and he thought that surely people who passed him on the street, if they heard him whistling these works of a Baroque composer and violinist, they wouldn't feel as though he was a danger to them. Um, and this seems to have worked for, for Claude Steele's friend, um, but that's not really practical as a public policy. Um, to, to you know, train every person uh, of color to whistle Vivaldi in order to not be threatening. Um, so it's, it's one kind of story, I think, that begins to offer some insight into the psychological processes that are at play when we think about how people, such as police, interact with Black Americans. Um, so I'm gonna be also talking here a little bit more about psychological insights into these disparities um, for the rest of this talk. What can we learn? Um, uh, from psychology about these disparities. Um, and there are multiple different processes that might be at play. Um, for example, um, uh, uh, something like explicit prejudice, just the idea that some people um, may just be very overtly biased and we can see overt bias at play in some of these events. Sometimes people just harbor very explicit racism that gets expressed in their behavior. Um, this is a very real phenomenon, but I'm also really going to focus on some of the more subtle forces as well. Um, things like implicit prejudice that Dr. Fuentes talked about, and uh, I'm also going to refer to that as automatic associations, the associations that, that people have in their minds between something like between blackness and threat, for example. I'm going to talk very briefly about stereotypes about size and threat, the idea in kind of embedded in American history that, um, that black Americans and black people are actually kind of um, larger than life and in, in, in this really kind of threatening way, which goes all the way back to, to 1619 and the beginnings of slavery. I'm also going to talk about something called prototypic, prototypicality biases. Um, I, I think I'll, I'll just kind of get to that in a few minutes. Um, so I'm, I'm going to, yeah, just uh, really through all of these um, highlights, uh, what I'm talking about when I talk about this concept, and then just a little bit of the research and, and, and the researchers that have conducted this work, this really important work. So in terms of automatic associations, one thing that we know is that um, one of the many insights contributed by social psychology is that um, has to do with implicit bias, or as I'm going to call them here, automatic associations. These are mental associations that are embedded in our culture that we form over a lifetime of essentially just being in the culture. People are raised and exist in a culture that places lower value on black lives than other lives. And this is manifest in, in multiple ways. For example, uh, Jennifer Eberhardt pictured here, who's a social psychologist at Stanford University, has conducted research on the idea of what she called in this one paper, seeing black, which uh, in which just being exposed to the face of a black man in this case, activated people's mental associations um, with concepts related to crime. So in some of this work and some of these studies, Dr. Eberhardt found that police officers are just as subject to these, these uh, biases as other civilians. So one thing that she found was that participants who saw a, uh, the face of a black man had um, concepts related to crime just automatically activated in their minds. And so there's this sort of automatic mental linkage in the minds of her uh, mostly white participants in this study. And that happened for police as well as civilians. Um, so she also found that police officers who were uh, primed or induced to think about crime, after they had crime activated in their minds, in a subsequent task, they automatically tended to shift their visual attention toward black faces. Again, showing that these police officers kind of became vigilant 
for uh, black male faces rather than white male faces when they were thinking about crime. So there's this reflexive visual attention that gets deployed um, among these police officers just when they're thinking about crime. Another set of, of work and studies has focused on what we might call weapon or shooter biases. So um, in related work, um, uh, researchers like Keith Payne in 2001 found that participants were quicker to identify a weapon on screen if that weapon that was briefly flashed up was preceded by the face of a black man uh, versus a white man. So just seeing the face of a black man made people um, more able to and, and more quickly um, recognize uh, a weapon that appeared on screen in this very quick reaction time task. Um, and some other work by Josh Carell and some of Carell's colleagues, participants in this first person shooter task were faster to um, virtually shoot a black person than a white person. Um, uh, uh, they were also more kind of accurate at, at detecting guns when they appeared with, with black and with white people. One really important thing that Carell found in this work is that police also show this bias. Um, in one study, they found that police actually kind of showed a weaker bias than most civilians, suggesting that maybe training actually helps um, to sort of diminish some of those biases. But then uh, kind of disturbingly in, a, in another study in, in a, a 2007 paper, um, Carell and colleagues found that that bias is actually even stronger among officers who basically spend their days on these squads um, that deal with really violent crime. So basically people who are out there on the streets um, really interacting with um, you know, people who are suspected of being violent criminals might actually even show some of these racial biases more strongly than others would. Um, and yet other work, um, this is something else that may play a role in some of these biases. Um, researchers like uh, Dr. Philip Goff, who's pictured here, have studied the dehumanization of black men and boys. Uh, so this is work that is really rooted in centuries of conquest and colonialization and slavery. Um, researchers like Dr. Goff are finding um, some really disturbing things, like the idea that, that participants implicitly or automatically associate black men with apes. And so they're, even at a very gut level, dehumanizing um, black people. Um, and another sort of set of findings from, from Dr. Goff actually showed that these dehumanization tendencies predict other important tendencies about how we interact with others and how we judge others. In one study, Dr. Goff found that um, dehumanization predicted the tendency to see black teenage boys as older than they are and older than same aged white boys. Um, and also more culpable for suspected crimes. And once again, Dr. Goff found that police show these biases as well uh, in, a, in, a, in one specific study where he recruited police participants. Dr. Goff has been doing some really important work over the last few years with an uh, organization that he founded called the Center for Policing Equity, in which he and his colleagues actually work with police to try to train them, uh, train them to work on some of these biases with things like implicit bias training, but also procedural justice training. Um, which we don't really have time to get into right now, but, but we can potentially talk about. Um, and then really briefly, I'll, I'll just talk about some of the work that, uh, that I've been doing with some of my colleagues, showing that people actually show inflated perceptions of the physical size of, of black men and women. Um, so basically we ran a bunch of studies where we found that if you show them uh, the faces of, uh, uh, or bodies in some studies of black men, young men and women, Participants overestimate the physical size and strength of, of uh, the black people relative to the white people. Um, and we've also found that what we call this size bias predicts a tendency to see black people as capable of causing more physical harm than whites, um, which then is used to justify police use of force. People are more likely to say that um, police force was justified um, against a black person than a white person who was of the same size because of this tendency to to see or to judge them as larger than they are. And then finally, in some other work related to that, uh, Hester and Gray in 2019 found that uh, looking at a massive database of New York uh, NYPD stop and frisk uh, encounters, tall black men were much more likely to be stopped and frisk than say tall white men. So not only do people see uh, black men and women as larger than same sized white men and women, but tall uh, black men, black men who are actually tall are disadvantaged even more than, than white men by that same kind of aspect of their own physical size. 
And um, finally, one thing that I wanted to sort of highlight that kind of can compound all of these biases that I just talked about was what we call racial prototypicality biases. So researchers like Keith Maddox, who, who's at Tufts University, who I've pictured here, has, has um, have done work showing that there are all these biases based on skin tone and facial features. So, and of course, most people are aware of things we might call it colorism or something like that. Um, and the findings in social psychology find that people who look more prototypically black, so having darker skin tone and having facial features that are more um, sort of prototypical of, of African Americans, suffer more extreme negative consequences of many of those aforementioned biases. Um, they, they activate more automatic biases. Um, they um, bring about more of the size biases that, that we studied in my research. Um, and, and so it's not just about race, it's not just about race as a social category, there are also these kind of variations within race that, that make some people even more um, kind of vulnerable to these really damaging perceptions and others. Um, and, and I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit here at, at the end about the search for solutions. Basically many remedies have, have been attempted. Um, as Dr. Fuentes talked about, um, about implicit bias training, and I think that's really important but one thing I will say is that there's mixed or sometimes weak evidence for the efficacy of bias training in um, changing uh, things like police behavior. Um, so that's really important, but it's also really important to think about not just trying to apply some sort of one size fits all implicit bias training solution. Um, we have to consider things like how willing are participants to participate in, in this work. Um, just a quick anecdote, I have a friend who is doing some work with the Anti-Defamation League in the last couple of years. Um, and they tried to partner with a bunch of different police departments and, and they were successful in some of these partnerships, but they also, one thing that happened is um, kind of after really high profile cases of uh, police uh, on civilian violence that got really a lot of attention in the press, certain police departments got a lot less willing to actually work um, with their organizations, specifically I think rank and file police officers who may not recognize the need to engage in such training. So we have to think really hard about how to actually get people to buy in to these trainings. Um, other research has shown, one thing that we talk about a lot is things like body cameras. If, if we can get officers to wear body cams, they'll, they'll be more accountable. Um, but data are actually showing that accountability measures like this don't tend to be very effective. They certainly allow us to see what happens, um, but they don't seem to really result in big changes in things like how much, uh, like police use of force. So we still have a ton of work to do there. Um, and one thing that I would also mention here is that this, this problem is kind of made more difficult by the fact that psychological factors are layered over systemic structural factors. Um, here I have pictured Dr. James Jones, another social psychologist who argued in a, in a 2017 special, special issue um, from the Journal of, of Social Issues on race and policing, he argued that due to the multidimensionality and complexity of the problem, there is no easy fix. Um, many approaches must be developed. We must go at people's automatic associations, their explicit bias, um, uh, perhaps things like procedural justice training and implicit bias training, um, but it can't just be one type of, of approach that, that we can expect to, to fix all of these problems. Um, uh, so I would just kind of argue here at the end that we need more than just bias training. It's certainly not the whole story that we just have individually um, biased police officers who we need to train out of their racism. We also need to th be thinking about things like uh, systemic change. Um, so police officers may exist, for example, in toxic cultures of enforcement. Um, sometimes they might be more individually prejudiced than the average civilian, but more importantly, they exist in this culture um, not just in the departments, but in the United States as a whole um, and in the world that devalues black people. Culture is so important here. Uh, and Dr. Fuentes already talked about uh, the role of kind of culture in building our implicit attitudes. Um, one paper that I think is, is really kind of interesting and, and powerful is by one of my colleagues, Eric Heyman, and, and some of his collaborators. What they found is that police killings in communities in the United States um, disproportionate killings of, of black Americans by police were actually predicted very strongly by community level implicit associations. So not how prejudiced was the police officer um, or how what kind of implicit associations the police officer had, but what was the average implicit association between blackness and threat 
uh, in the members of that community at large when those police shootings happen, which kind of argues that um, in this really almost very disturbing way that bias is just kind of in the air around us. And so we really have to figure out how to clear that air because that might be kind of our best bet to solving some of these, these problems. Um, and then finally, this goes beyond just killing and violence. Um, we of course can look at disparities and who is, is, is killed by police, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's not everybody's everyday experience. Um, lots of work, and I think Dr. Grapen is gonna get into some of this as well, shows that experiencing racism and racial profiling affects physical and, and mental health. Um, and we know that exposure just to news, even if you're not experiencing it your, yourself, exposure to news of traumatic events and racially traumatic events is detrimental detrimental to mental health as well. Um, so, you know, all of that shows that even if you're not out there actually having encounters with police yourself, all of this stuff can really have a powerful effect on you. And I think we as educators have to be aware of what these experiences are doing to our students because we serve a really wonderful group of students who are strong, but they're also vulnerable. Um, and many of them are no doubt more acutely attuned to these injustices than they've ever been before or than we may be. Um, and so we really owe it to them, I think, to be effective leaders, to support them, and to stand for, for positive change. Um, so with that, um, thanks for letting me share all of this with you. I'd be happy to, to take some questions or, or comments. I can go ahead and unshare my screen. Um. Thanks, John. The data is overwhelming. Um, so, it, and, and, and provocative, I would say, also. Um, so, uh, before our next talk, um, we open uh, the stage for some questions from the audience to uh, John about his research, about the data he presented. Please, in the text, or raise your hand. Let's open up. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I see. And I, so I'm happy to, to try to answer any questions that pop up, but anyone else who feels like they, they have insight and input could, could hop in as well. I see a question from uh, Ciara Cordero asking, do I think if MLK was still here that this problem of racism would be stopped? Um, in short, I would say no to, to that. Um, I think it's really important that we have kind of transform transformational leaders who can inspire people to work for positive change. Um, but I also think that um, there's so much there. I, I think that um, we in these current days tend to overestimate how popular Dr. King was. He was seen in his own time as the threat to the status quo and many people, um, even, you know, not just people who we would think of as hardcore racists, many people who would consider themselves much more moderate also saw him as as trouble and as a threat. So I think that um, someone with his leadership style and someone with the message that he had was really, really important uh, for so many reasons. Um, but I, he, you know, a presence of someone like him wouldn't wouldn't just make these these problems go away. Dr. Wilson, I don't I don't have the ability to raise my hand, so I thought I'd just kind of chime in real quick. Um, can't help but like put my community psychology hat on right now as we have this conversation. I feel like a lot, a lot of the stuff that we're we're sharing is more reactive or responsive, more like tertiary prevention, right? So the damage has been done. You know, we've we've created racist ideology, and so how do we uh, grapple with that? I'm wondering, like from an upstream perspective, right? How do we go upstream to a primary prevention approach where? we stop socializing people to, to be oppressive? Um, I know that's a, it's a big question, but I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind commenting on it. Yeah, that's a really important question. I think um, you've identified something incredibly important. Um, and right, so I think it's really valuable, for example, that we're here having this conversation, um, but it's incredibly critical that we don't just continue to have conversations like this in a reactive way. Um, I think there's perhaps more energy around this uh, among many people right now than, the, than there has been in a long time. So I, I hope more generally that we can kind of harness that energy, um, not just this week and next week, but, but going forward, um, but also in a proactive way, like you say. Um, so I do think that, for example, there are people out there 
doing important work about how to um, kind of in, instill reforms in, in police departments. But I do think that we should be thinking as, as psychologists um, about how to um, not eliminate those that work, but to sort of um, mitigate the need for that at the level of policing. Um, because the people who enter those departments are people just like the rest of us are. Um, so yes, it really does come down to trying to find ways to really change the way that we that we acculturate our children um, from a very young age, having conversations with our kids, um, not just about um, kind of being nice to to each other, but um, about things like race. Um, having a, and, and you know, part of the work has to be done. Much of the work has to be done by white folks like myself having conversations with your kids about um, you know the privileges that um, that we as as their parents and as as kids may enjoy that um, that some of their friends might uh, might not enjoy because of things like race. John Paul, this is uh, Dan. I have I have a question. You, I don't know if you might be able to answer. Do you? know anything of maybe like in policing when it comes to something akin to like a bystander intervention where how do you train groups of people to intervene when they see something inappropriate like George Floyd for instance having the other cops step in to stop a superior police officer from doing something wrong is there anything on that like more broadly how do you kind of train cops to step up and do the right thing Ooh, that's a really good question. I don't know. Um, yeah, so I guess anecdotally, I did read at some point that the the bystander officers in this case were very new to the force. Um, I think, so yes, I'm not aware of any research about that. Um, what kind of social psychologist are you, John Paul? <laughs> I know. Um, the, well, there, I, I kind of think there may not be, well, who knows? There's a whole literature on criminology that that I'm just not familiar enough with. But that's an important question: is there is there a way that we can kind of train officers to um, to overcome the bystander tendencies that that kind of affect all of us? And yes, of course, things like rank and authority and seniority would would really be important there as well. I think one thing is, unfortunately, the presence of body cameras doesn't. We we thought that that might kind of give more accountability um, to officers, but one sort of ironic effect of body cameras might also be that officers might even feel less willing to step in and stop one of their colleagues um, because the, then that body cam evidence could be used to punish them institutionally if it is shown that they kind of stepped out of bounds for some reason. Um, so it's, that's kind of a, a complicated issue, I think. Dr. Wilson, there's another comment in the chat saying from Nina saying she's read small pieces of information regarding systematic racism in the field of social work. Do you have any insight on this? She imagines a decent amount of psych majors are planning to get their MSWs. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I think and other people certainly I, I hope might be able to, to step in here as well. I don't, I have very little insight into exactly, you know, the exact kind of work that's going on in social work, but I do think that's, that you're thinking in the right direction if you're interested in um, learning how to, and I do see someone's hand is raised here as well. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're interested in, in learning about um, systemic racism, I know that if, if you take courses in social work, you will learn, you'll take some sociology classes as well that, that focus on race and contemporary social problems and things like that. Anyone else that wants to jump in certainly can. Hi, this is me. I'm a adjunct faculty member in the social work department. Um, I know NASW, which is uh, the National Association for Social Workers, New Jersey, have been putting out a bunch of webinars for community members and social workers talking about um, the topics of systemic racism, racism, but also how it plays out in the field of social work. So for Nina, if you're interested, I would check out at ASW New Jersey to look at some of those webinars because they're talking a lot about 
the issues that we talk about in social work, but also how does this play out in the field? Because um, a lot of social workers are white folks and how does this field, how does racism play out in actually um, working as a social worker? So that, that's my suggestion. I'll also add, John, that um, a lot of the programs that accredit these mental health professional disciplines, social work, counseling, psychology, they, they do expect students to develop some competency around individual and cultural uh, diversity. And so that's kind of built into the training. I will say as a, as a site visitor, it's done uh, ineptly, it's done inconsistently, it's done haphazardly. Uh, sometimes it's got the feel of like, they're checking the box, right? The box is being checked. Okay, we, we did it, but there's not a, a deep uh, pervasive attempt to help people develop this competency. There is a, there's another question from Marilyn Davis. Can you say it, John? Marilyn wants to know, what do you think the space for social psychologists in community learning about race in support of public good could slash should might look like? Uh, great question. I think that um, that's something that's really important. Um, the, the idea that we should bring our work to, to the public and make sure that we're actually trying to use it to, to apply to, to these problems. And that's really been done in a lot of ways. Um, another thing that, uh, um, that came up previously was things like um, learning about interventions about things like interracial contact, that prejudice tends to be reduced by putting people together and, and having them work together. And so social psychologists have been kind of um, central to efforts like that, to going into schools and helping develop interventions um, that actually put students together in cooperative and collaborative teams um, uh, with the effect of generally reductions in prejudice. Social psychologists are certainly really active as well in kind of um, working with agencies like, like uh, police, um, police departments and trying to institute some of these reforms that we're talking about. Um, so I do think that, yes, that is um, a space that we should be occupying. Um, we, of course, want to do so with confidence that we have good evidence. Um, but um, but that's something that's really important for us to be doing. Okay, so we have if we have no more comments or questions, then we're just going to take a few minutes, maybe about five minute break, and uh, Dr. Graben is going to jump in. Yes, we're going to start the, the next uh, talk at 12.30 uh, in, in three minutes. Uh, Jasmine actually have Wi-Fi issues, not the computer issues, so that's, that's actually more crucial. But uh, we are working, or she's working on getting back in, and if she succeeded, then she'll close the event. If not, we are going to record her lecture uh, outside the Zoom, and then when we make this proceeding available or somewhere, we're going to we're going to add her, uh, we're not going to give up on her talk, so um, so, so we'll see how it goes. Um, so Sally, are you, are you ready with your uh, uh, presentation? I am, yes. I just wanted to, I was going to send Jen a private chat because sometimes I have trouble sharing my PowerPoint screen and I think I've figured out a mechanism, but I, I need her help to do it. So Jen, just wanted to give you a heads up. I'll send you a chat. Got it. I'm here. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, John, I think it was well done. I think that it's, it's, it's overwhelming a little bit, to tell you the truth. Uh, and um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, I agree. Yeah. Um, so uh, as Dr. Arie said, um, my name is Sally Grapin. I'm a faculty member in the psychology department here at MSU. Um, I'm really honored to have a chance to present on the impact of discrimination on mental health today because these conversations clearly just have such relevance for understanding and combating racism in our immediate university environment. And I'm also just really glad that we're able to structure these conversations more as an interactive activity because we really can't even begin to address these problems without the full participation of our university community. So um, I'm really looking forward to, to talking with everyone today. Oh, 
Okay, so before I begin, I just want to provide a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about. And in particular, today, I want to spend some time talking about the relevance of these issues for college students. Um, I want to talk about the many ways in which students of color experience discrimination in college settings specifically. Um, I want to spend a little time talking about both in-person discrimination and online discrimination, given that we spend so much time in virtual environments right now, and so that's becoming um, increasingly relevant for us. Um, I also want to spend some time, of course, uh, like the title of the talk indicates, talking about the relationship between discrimination and mental health. And then I want to leave some time for us to reflect as a group on opportunities and barriers related to dismantling systems of oppression and discrimination. And I hope to hear from many of you in this conversation, and I have a, a structured activity for us to work on as well. Okay, so before we start talking about discrimination and mental health, I think we really need to set the stage in terms of the paradigms that we're actually using to frame the, frame the problem. So the study of psychology has a very long history in and of itself of perpetuating racism, often hiding behind what it deems to be objective empirical methodologies that ultimately serve to promote the interests of white populations. So for example, when I teach my students about IQ tests in our school psychology class, we often talk about how when IQ tests first emerged, they were actually used as a mechanism for asserting white superiority and asserting the inferiority of people of color. Um, nowadays, racism is still very much alive in psychological research, and we need to understand that. But it often manifests in ways that are more subtle. And one of the very dangerous ways in school psychology in particular, and really many disciplines, that it manifests is through perpetuating a deficit-oriented lens. So assuming a deficit-oriented lens involves attributing social and psychological problems to deficiencies that are believed to exist within a person or among a group of people. And deficit-oriented thinking is especially prominent in models such as the traditional medical model of psychological research and practice. And in a traditional medical model, mental health problems are seen as arising primarily from internal states of pathology or within person deficiencies. Now, this is a very short-sighted and dangerous paradigm because when applied to communities of color, it's often used to imply that there's something inherently wrong with them or the way that they relate to other people. So what we need to move toward and what many scholars have already moved towards is an, ecolog an ecological model as well as a strength-based one. Ecological models acknowledge the many ways in which interlocking layers of the environment converge to shape an individual's experiences and behaviors. Of course, this is a much more useful way for conceptualizing the relations between discrimination and mental health because it acknowledges that psychological difficulties arise from systemic injustices that oppress people of color. Strength-based models also acknowledge the many ways um, in which personal and cultural assets that people bring to their experiences support positive outcomes. So including long-standing histories of resistance and trailblazing are all aspects that enhance social and psychological well-being. So in our discussion today, I just wanted to start off by talking about that because we really need to think consciously about applying a strength-based ecological framework um, and we really need to move towards a framework in which white communities can acknowledge and accept responsibility for, per for perpetuating systemic oppression that harms communities of color on a daily basis. And so as psychology students, I would encourage you guys to think strongly about the ways in which psychological research can sometimes gravitate towards that traditional medical model and away from the ecological model, and just to be more aware of it as you're, as you're reading. Okay. So now let's talk about the types of discrimination that college students may experience in university settings. First, it's very important to acknowledge that this range of experiences is vast. Um, it can include instances of violence, instances of hate speech, down to things that are much more subtle like microaggressions, and I know uh, a lot of our faculty members have talked about what that looks like today. Um, I can imagine that, of course, many of you have heard of the term microaggression several times in your classes, but I do think it is important for us to go over um, the many ways in which these uh, experiences manifest in college settings specifically. So I'll just reiterate um, Dr. Fuentes' definition that he presented of microaggressions. And so broadly defined, we can think about them as brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities 
whether they be intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile and derogatory messages toward people from racial and ethnic minoritized backgrounds. And so microaggressions themselves have been characterized and categorized many different ways in the literature, but today we're going to break them down into two broad categories, which are interpersonal microaggressions and environmental microaggressions. So interpersonal microaggressions are exchanged between or among individuals. College students of color experience so many different types of microaggressions on campus, but some of the most common we see in the literature are assumptions of inferiority, assumptions of criminality, and micro invalidations, which is an important one that I really want to talk about. So these types of microaggressions can be uh, seen in behaviors such as acting surprised by a student of color's academic or professional success, or avoiding eye contact with people of color. And micro, micro invalidations, like I had said, are particularly noteworthy because they often involve denying the daily realities of the oppression experienced by people of color. So one thing that I often hear from other white people and college students in general is that somehow younger generations are a lot less racist than older generations. And I'm sure many of us have heard this many times. This is just simply not true. Racism is still very much alive in the US, as you can see through all of these presentations today. And over time, what it's done is really just found ways to become increasingly camouflaged, especially by design to people who hold power. And so again, we can't say that younger generations are less racist than older generations because it's just simply not true. And regardless of whether any of us chose to be born into this, the reality is that we're responsible as white people for perpetuating this and we need to be held accountable. What is talked to less about, I would say relatively, than interpersonal microaggressions is environmental microaggressions. Environmental microaggressions are hostile messages that are communicated instead through the physical or social context of one's surroundings. So very recently, a study was published in the Journal of Diversity in Higher Education that looked at environmental microaggressions experienced by Black college students on campuses specifically. Um, and specifically, this happened in a predominantly white university setting. So through focus groups and qualitative analysis, the author was able to distill six major types of environmental microaggressions, including response to criminality, as exemplified perhaps by being treated differently by university police, segregation, which included unspoken expectations about where students of color spend time on campus, lack of representation, such as having few faculty members and students on campus who identified as black, cultural bias in courses, which involves excluding um, readings and ideas by scholars of color and instead relying on primarily content that centers white and Eurocentric values and views. Tokenism, which involves asking people of color to represent their larger or racial ethnic group or ethnic groups. And pressure to conform, which involves covert pressure to surrender one's cultural values and behaviors and ultimately suppress the authentic expression of their identities. So as you can see, these are really just a few ways that environmental microaggressions manifest on campuses, but um, a representation of the vast range of experiences that students of color have on in post-secondary settings. So now, of course, our environments are ever changing in light of the pandemic. And increasingly, we're finding ourselves in virtual spaces that uh, more in virtual spaces than we are in in person settings. And so I think it's also important to understand how racial discrimination manifests in the world of zoom social media texting and other online technologies. So we know that online spaces create a multitude of opportunities for students to be exposed to racism, given that nearly 100% of undergraduates routinely access the internet. We also know that discriminatory content is rampant in online settings such as Twitter, YouTube, and other social media. And in fact, if you want to just get an idea of exactly how rampant, it's been estimated that racial and ethnic slurs are used on Twitter approximately 10,000 times per day alone, just one social media platform. And so finally, the other thing that makes online discrimination different than in-person discrimination is the fact that it really can be happening 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, sometimes late at night when people are um, alone in their apartments and they don't necessarily really have their networks of social support around them. Um, so the potential for exposure is very, very great. 
So online discrimination is a relatively newer but still very established area of research. And if we had to provide a definition of online discrimination, one of the most commonly cited ones um, is that it refers to the denigration of others from racial and ethnic minoritized backgrounds through a variety of sources, whether it's video, images, text, and other digital media. Um, and like microaggressions, we can think about online discrimination as falling within two broad categories. So individual discrimination and vicarious discrimination. So if we had to look at individual discrimination, it basically refers to hostile messages directed at a particular individual, such as sending, sending someone a message with racist content or excluding them from an online forum. And then if we looked at vicarious discrimination, this is actually the more common experience that students report. Um, it's discrimination that's directed, they witness it perhaps, uh, perhaps happening to another person, or it's broad posts that are designed for very large audiences. So for example, if somebody posts something widely on Facebook or on Instagram, it's not necessarily targeted at an individual, it's often targeted at a larger racial or ethnic group, and so it's considered a form of vicarious discrimination. And so we don't exactly have very precise estimates of this time about how often this happens to students of color, but we actually do have quite a bit of research about how often it happens to middle school and high school students and adolescents. And so some of that research shows us that approximately 71% of youth report exposure to vicarious discrimination, which is the more common one, and then nearly 30%, so a very substantial number of students report exposure to individual discrimination in online settings as well. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about the impact of discrimination on mental health for college students. So research linking discrimination to mental health is extremely plentiful in the literature. Um, so much so that we see a number of meta-analyses on this topic alone. Um, just as a quick reminder to students, if you're wondering uh, about what a meta-analysis is, it's basically a quantitative study design that summarizes the results of many studies that have studied the same phenomenon. So it allows us basically to summarize research to get a broader picture of what that landscape of research is telling us. So I just have a couple of meta-analyses here to share with you. Um, for example, Pasco and Richmond found that the average correlation between discrimination exposure and mental health was negative 0.20. So that higher levels of discrimination were associated with lower levels of psychological well-being. And this finding has been replicated many times, um, notably by Yip et al. was a really particularly well-designed one. Um, when we look across the literature, the bottom line is that discrimination has very consistently been associated with a, a variety of poor mental health outcomes. And I have only a few of them listed on this slide here, but some of the most commonly studied ones are depression, generalized anxiety, social anxiety, somatic symptoms, and broadly speaking, psychological adjustment. So again, these encapsulate only a few of the symptoms that are looked at, but again, the research here is, is very plentiful. Okay, so discrimination also impacts many other important outcomes for college students, and many of those are academic in nature or just relate to their social experiences on campus. So for example, we know discrimination beyond mental health is also associated with potentially lower levels of academic achievement, engagement, and motivation. And it's really important for us to think about the ways that sometimes these academic outcomes relate to the mental health problems that students are experiencing as a result of exposure to discrimination. So for example, I just have um, a visual from some research my team and I were conducting recently. Um, we looked at online racial and ethnic discrimination in the sample of black college students. And so again, this diagram shows us a little bit about what we found. Um, we ultimately found that higher levels of discrimination were associated with lower levels of university belonging. And university belonging refers to how much a person feels connected to their college community and feels like they're a part of their college community. However, we also found that online discrimination was associated with university belonging indirectly through social anxiety. So while we can't actually infer causality in this particular situation due to a lot of, uh, due to the study design itself, what this study does tell us is that mental health outcomes affect the way that online discrimination acts on other important social and academic outcomes for college students. So there really are many ways in which discrimination broadly impacts the well-being of students. 
What we also know from research is that there are a number of factors that can weaken the impact of discrimination on mental health. And these variables are commonly called protective factors because they buffer the relationship between harmful forces and psychological outcomes, such as mental health. And across populations, research has examined many different types of protective factors, including ethnic identity, coping strategies, self-esteem, optimism, and social support. And so what this model is showing us here is that discrimination directly impacts mental health outcomes, but in the presence of some of these protective factors like coping strategies, ethnic and racial identity, et cetera, that relationship between discrimination and mental health is weakened or mitigated. So that's why we call it essentially a protective factor. And so if we're looking at this list of protective factors, um, one of the one that's the, one of the ones I think that's been most widely studied so far is ethnic and racial identity. So ethnic and racial identity refers to the extent to which an individual has explored their identity, um, the extent to which they feel a psychological attachment or grounding in their identity. Um, and in the Yip et al. meta-analysis that we were just talking about a couple slides ago, um, when we look across the literature, we find that ERI is a particularly robust protective factor against discrimination. And so what this tells us is that, again, it buffers that relationship between discrimination and mental health outcomes. And so what I take away from this research when I look at it is that these findings really underscore the importance of building university communities that give students of color the space to explore, express, and affirm their respective identities. Okay, so I also just wanna talk about um, a few more cautions as we consider this type of work. Um, so while focusing on protective factors and understanding them is really crucial for supporting the well-being of students of color, we really have to make sure that we don't lose sight of the larger issue, which is ultimately dismantling systems of racism in the first place that cause that kind of distress. Um, and this really requires collaboration on the part of all members of the university community. However, in particular, I wanna emphasize the importance for white students and faculty and white members of the community to really spend time reflecting on their beliefs, their biases and behaviors and values going forward. So that being said, um, I do have a, a quick activity in mind that I would like to spend some time doing just so we can think about, reflect on um, situations in which people are likely to take action or perhaps not so likely to take action. Um, so if you have a paper and pen with you, please just take a few moments. I want you to just rate these items on a scale from one, which is very unlikely, to four, which is very likely. Um, notice that in a traditional Likert scale, there might be an option for either very likely or very unlikely, but we purposely removed this one because there really is no space for neutrality when it comes to issues of race. Um, we really have to be evaluating whether we're likely and actually going to do something, right, versus taking a step back and, and relinquishing ourselves from that responsibility. So um, again, if you have a paper and pen, I'd like you just to take a minute just to rate, e rate each of these items, okay? I'll give you guys a few minutes to think about them. Um, I won't ask anybody to share their answers out loud unless they don't, unless they feel like they want to. Um, but if you do want to talk about this after the activity, I would really love to hear people's thoughts and, and I hope we will be able to get a dialogue going. So, okay. So how likely would you be to address a microaggression perpetuated by, and there's several individuals here, I just want you to rate each of them on a scale of one to four. Is everybody just about done? Need more time? It's hard to see, I can't see everybody on the Zoom screen here. I can only see a few people. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and flip. Okay, keep your answers in mind. Okay. What I want you to do is I want you to go back and look at your answers and think about would any of your answers change if you could not do so anonymously. So say for example, you were online, in some cases this can be done anonymously, in some cases it cannot be done anonymously, but would your answers change if you could not do so anonymously?
Okay. Just going to flip again. Okay. Think about now, would your answers change if you perceived that the incident was somehow unintentional on the part of the person? And really, I would encourage you to be honest with yourselves because, again, I'm not asking you to share answers. Um, the purpose of this is to really think about what you would actually do in this situation. Okay. Would your answers change if somehow previous attempts to address the problem were unsuccessful? So maybe you had had a conversation with this person before, or you had seen somebody else have a conversation with this person before, and the person either became defensive or they brushed it off. Flip one more time. Would your answers change if you were somehow in a larger group setting? Flip one more time. Would your answers change if you were surrounded by people from your own racial or ethnic background? And go ahead and flip again. Would your answers change if you were surrounded by people from other racial or ethnic backgrounds? Okay. Um, so I hope I gave people enough time to talk to do this. Um, I actually had a few more exercises as well, but it's, I'm just looking at the amount of time I've been sharing my screen and I'm wondering if we want to switch to more of a conversation or we want to consider, continue um, engaging in some reflective exercises. Um, any, any thoughts about that? I, it's, it's hard for me to see the chat. Um, Sally, Sally, you hear me? Okay, I don't see anything popping up. Um, I would be inclined to open this up for some discussion um, about the activity in particular, um, to hear your thoughts, hear any questions you guys have about this. But again, um, I'm happy to, to do either way, to keep going with more activity or to have a conversation. But um, I think for now, why don't we try opening it up? Yes, uh, Sally, I think Jasmine has, has rejoined. So let, let's have some question and answers about the, can you, can you hear me, Sally? 
Sorry, you know what? I had my I had my earbuds and now I can hear you. Yeah, okay. there we okay. go. So they're telling me that Jasmine uh, might be able to present after all. So let's let's open it up for questions and, and answers and reflection on this on this latest activity. So when we can, you know, keep keep the time schedule. Okay, sounds good. Um, so I guess I can I can start by asking a question. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts really on, on anything we talked about today, but also um, in terms of the activity, um, what, what were some of the thoughts? What were some of the things going through your head if you're willing to share? Um, part of the reason we do this activity is to understand, um, to let some kind of biases surface, um, in particular to let some points of fragility surface about why we would or would not act in certain situations. And I think that these thoughts can be a good starting point for understanding what some of the barriers are to us actually addressing racism in college settings. Um, so I would really love to hear your thoughts. Hey, Sally, it's Milton. Hey. Thanks, thank, thanks for the exercise. It, it was interesting to see how things uh, shift when there's a power differential between you and the person you need to challenge or question. Um, there's a, I definitely saw like my answer shifting when I felt a sense of support amongst people who are like me versus people who are not like me. And I can see myself being, feeling a bit oppressed if I can't express myself when I'm not strong to people who, who get me. So I appreciate um, all the ebbing and flowing that happened with this activity. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed your talk, too. Hi, Sally. This is Marilyn Davis from the Center of Pedagogy, MSUNER. I wanted to thank you for your presentation. And I found myself um, thinking about, well, why wouldn't I say something in certain settings? And the notion of surveillance, especially when it comes to um, your superiors and those who may not have um, a deeper understanding of what it means to be racist or to experience racism. And um, it just forced me to reflect on my responses and my yays and nays. And th that, that consciousness of surveillance is always there um, that influences your actions, behaviors, and decisions. Yeah, and thank you so much for saying that too, because it's something that I think about when I look at this activity too, about all of the invisible structures around us that I don't think about consciously unless I really try to think about consciously. Um, and I think sometimes this exercise um, at least reminds me to remember all of the invisible pieces and the surveillance that would potentially prevent me or change my answers in some way. Um, thank you for mentioning that. So Sally, is there, is there actual quantitative research on how people change their answers? I mean, beyond the exercise. Um, not to much, we, well, it's applied to this, not necessarily specifically. I mean, there's tons of research, of course, on the ways that norms operate on people's behaviors around racism and what they would do in particular settings. Um, I think that a lot of this research probably a lot still needs to be done, I think, to really better understand this. And I think there are some barriers to people being honest in these kinds of settings about what they would actually do. Um, I think there's a tendency when people don't feel like they're knowledgeable about something to not want to, um, you know, talk about biases, disclose biases. And so I think that there is some research out there suggesting that norms are operating on us. But again, a lot of work needs to, to be done in this area. So this activity in particular, though, wasn't necessarily, this is just something that I've, um, I've done before with you know a group, other groups and classes and things like that, but I didn't necessarily pull this from a from a study or anything. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, Sally, you want to stop sharing the screen, or uh, or somebody else share the screen? Who shared the screen? Who knows who shared the screen? Sure. Uh, I shared the screen actually. I shared the screen. Okay. Um, just as a concluding thought, though, I would just say to anybody who is kind of really done and thought through this exercise, if you really got some concrete answers about this, about um, what would stop you from addressing something. Um, I would encourage you, especially to my, to my white colleagues as well, I would encourage you to think about um, what, what you need to do now to help remove that barrier, essentially. What is the next step that you need to take um, to be a more proactive agent um, in, in your own environments? Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Sally. That was, uh, that was very good. Hi, I'm Jasmine Reyes Portillo, and I'm currently an assistant professor in the psychology department at Montclair State University. I want to note that I am the child of Puerto Rican and Ecuadorian immigrants and currently coming to you from Brooklyn, New York, which is originally the land of the Nayak and Canarsie Native American people. Given that we're talking about race and social justice, I thought it would be important to acknowledge that we are all currently sitting on land that was once taken from other people. I'm a clinical psychologist by training and my research broadly focuses on reducing mental health disparities among racial and ethnic minority youth suffering from depression, anxiety, and suicidality. I also teach a graduate level multicultural psychology course, which focuses on increasing cultural competence. And much of the material for this talk today was drawn uh, from some of what we discuss in that course. This talk is gonna highlight four issues related to challenging racism. That is, in order to challenge racism, we first need to understand what it is. Next, we need to turn inward and become aware of our own attitudes and biases. One way to challenge our attitudes and biases is to learn from others who are different from us. And finally, we need to take personal responsibility for combating racism in our society if anything is ever gonna change. I wanna start out uh, today by watching a brief video of an incident that occurred a few weeks ago in Central Park. This video may be upsetting for some. However, in order to challenge racism, uh, we really need to start uh, calling it out when we see it. Would you please stop? Sir, I'm asking you to stop. Please don't come close to me. Sir, I'm asking you to stop recording me. Please, please don't come off. close to me. Please take your phone off. Please don't come close to and me. I'm taking pictures of calling the cops. Please, please call the cops. Please call the cops. I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. Please tell them whatever you like. Excuse me? I'm sorry, I'm in the ramble, and there is a man, African-American, he has a bicycle helmet. He is recording me and threatening me and my dog. There is an African-American man, I am in Central Park, he is recording me and threatening myself and my dog. <laughs> and my I'm sorry, I can't hear you either. I'm being threatened by a man in the ramble. Please send the cops immediately. I'm in Central Park in the ramble. I don't know. Thank you. I guess one question that I have for you all is, would you consider this an act of racism? And it seems like the general consensus is that most of you agree um, that this definitely um, is an act motivated by racism or, or racial prejudice. So here you have Amy Cooper calling the police on Christian Cooper after he asked her to leash his dog um, in this uh, ramble area in Central Park. Now, According to the video, it doesn't seem that Christian really is threatening her. I mean, he is recording her, but she is on the phone um, saying that he is threatening her. And in particular, that, you know, he's a, he's a black man or an African-American man, and you know, he's threatening her and that she feels unsafe. And so um, this really calls into question um, Amy's motives, her rationale uh, for calling the police, uh, you know, against Christian um, and, 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 and really why she's doing that, right? Why, why is it necessary um, uh, to call the police uh, to say this is the black man that's attacking me uh, when there could have been so many other options. She could have walked away, she could have flicked them off, flipped them off, um, but instead she chose to call the police and, and say that she was being a, a threat and that she was fearful for her own safety, um, which is some really questionable behavior uh, which unfortunately, um, you know, ended up, um, you know, costing Amy a lot. So costing, costing her, her, 
her job among, among other things. And so racism has a long and unpleasant history in the United States. Though some progress has been made, it remains a significant problem. Racism uh, refers to negative behaviors directed at a specific racial group. Relatedly, racial prejudice refers to holding a hostile attitude towards a person due to their race. Most people associate racism with blatant and overt acts of discrimination that are epitomized by white supremacy and hate crimes. However, in 1970, Koval distinguished between two forms of racism, diminutive racism and aversive racism. Now, diminutive racism is, old, is the old fashioned blatant form, whereas aversive racism is hypothesized to be qualitatively different than sort of blatant old fashioned racism. Aversive racists sympathize with victims of past injustice support the principles of racial equality, and genuinely regard themselves as non-prejudiced, but at the same time possess conflicting, often non-conscious negative feelings and beliefs about racial or ethnic minorities. In addition to the negative feelings that aversive racists have towards racial or ethnic minorities, um, that don't necessarily uh, reflect open hostility or ha hatred, Instead, their reactions uh, typically uh, involve discomfort, anxiety, or fear. That is, while they find Blacks or other racial or ethnic minorities aversive, uh, they also find any suggestion that they might be prejudiced aversive as well. And so this is very closely related to what Dr. Fuentes was talking about when we think about implicit biases, right? And so when we think about aversive racism, it often goes hand in hand uh, with implicit biases uh, regarding race um, that people are not uh, aware of that in turn can have an impact on how they act, particularly in these sort of um, ambiguous situations. So Dr. Fuentes also um, mentioned microaggressions. Um, which is originally coined by Chester Pierce to describe the subtle and automatic put downs that African Americans face. Since then, the definition has been expanded to apply to any minority or marginalized group. Microaggressions can be defined as brief everyday exchanges that send denigrating messages to a target group, such as people of color, religious minorities, women, people with disabilities, and LGBT individuals. These exchanges can be verbal, nonverbal, behavioral, or be transmitted through the environment. Microaggressions tend to be subtle, unintentional, and indirect, and often occur in situations where there are alternative explanations. They tend to represent unconscious and ingrained biases um, and attitudes, and are more likely to occur when people pretend not to notice differences. Uh, thereby denying that race, sex, sexual orientation, religion, or ability had anything to do with their actions. However, racism really goes beyond um, the individual. It goes beyond fashion racism, aversive racism, and microaggressions. Racism is commonly reduced to the phenomenon of not liking people because of their skin color, um, exemplified by racially exclusionary laws, the use of racial slurs, and the widespread terrorizing of people of color by white supremacists. However, this I know it when I see it conceptualization of racism cannot explain current social conditions, such as the systemic incarceration of people of color, uh, the persistence of oppressive uh, racial geographic segregation in the US, and enduring patterns of underemployment um, for populations of color um, that have been going on for decades. Uh, critical race theorists have come to define racism broadly as a complex system um, and process of oppression and privilege along socially constructed lines of race. Relatedly, systemic racism includes the policies and practices entrenched 
and established institutions, which result in the exclusion or promotion of designated groups. It differs from overt discrimination in that no individual intent is necessary. And so as some evidence of some systemic racism in our society, uh, considering the wealth gap, about 27% of African Americans currently live below poverty, poverty level compared to about 10.8% of non-Hispanic whites. In terms of employment for the past 60, year, 60 years, uh, black unemployment is always about twice as high as white unemployment. With regard to healthcare, approximately 11% of African Americans are not covered by health insurance compared to about 7% for non-Hispanic whites. Related uh, to COVID-19, black individuals are more than twice as likely to die from COVID than white individuals. In terms of incarceration, African Americans are incarcerated at more than five times the rates of white Americans. And then finally, sadly, related to maternal and infant mortality, black women are two to three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than white women and African Americans have about two times the infant mortality rate um, as non-Hispanic whites. Um, so there are definitely um, some very wide uh, disparities across our society with regard to race. And so being part of uh, gaining cultural competence um, involves understanding the history of oppression experienced by marginalized groups in our society. The stories of discrimination and pain of the oppressed are often minimized and neglected. Many contend that the reality of racism, sexism, and homophobia is relatively unknown or ignored by, ignored by those in power because of the discomfort that pervades uh, such topics. Um, and another thing that should be noted is that the experience of racism doesn't just affect the mental and physical health of the individual. Um, it definitely is something um, that has a very significant impact um, on the community itself. After recogni recognizing what racism looks like in our society, it's really important to turn inward and examine our own attitudes and biases. And here, uh, when we think about multicultural psychology and um, guidelines for attaining cultural competence, I believe uh, many of these um, apply uh, to everyone, something that anyone can use, not just clinicians. Um, so the first step is becoming more aware of your own cultural heritage, right? Uh, really becoming aware of your own racist, sexist, heterosexist, or other detrimental attitudes and beliefs, aware of the impact that your own values and biases um, can have on your interactions with others, particularly those who are different from yourselves, and really coming to a place where differences are not seen as deviant, right? Where we're not viewing people who are different from us as lesser than. So an important part of increasing your own self-awareness is really beginning to question uh, your own culture and cultural groups, right? So when we think about culture, there's superficial culture, what's clearly visible to others on the outside, um, as well as deep culture, right? So um, those things that are sort of internal to the individual. So thinking about their values, beliefs, and attitudes. So starting with superficial culture, really considering what's the cultural connotation of my name? Does my physique bear a cultural meaning? Does my appearance uh, convey a cultural nuance? Does my skin color have an ethnic, racial, and or cultural significance? And do, does my language um, or do my language and speech have cultural implications? With regard to deep culture, really considering what's my cultural heritage? Uh, what was the culture of my parents and ancestors? What cultural groups do I identify with? What is my world, uh, 
view orientation and what aspects of my worldview are congruent with the dominant or mainstream cultural cultural's worldview. An important uh, part of increasing our own awareness um, is acknowledging white privilege and our positions within the system. White privilege can be defined as the unearned advantages and benefits that accrue to white folks by virtue of a, syst of a system norm on the experiences, values, and perceptions of their group. I know this can be an uncomfortable conversation to have, but being an ally means using our privilege, using your own privilege um, to help create change. And it's hard to do that without recognizing what privilege really means in our society. So overall, the US continues to favor white Eurocentric ways of thinking, acting, and being that do not match the reality of people of color. In this respect, two sides of the coin are present. On the one side, white privilege automatically confers dominance, control, and power to white Americans. And on the other side, it automatically disempowers and oppresses people of color. Amy Cooper, uh, from our earlier video example, can be seen um, as an example of white privilege. She was leveraging a history of privilege as a white woman and relying on a false narrative of being especially vulnerable uh, to predatory attacks from black men. Privilege is born out of a hierarchical system where some people have more advantages than others. They do stuff like, I don't like this conversation about leashing my dog, so I'm gonna call the NYPD and play the white damsel in distress role. White privilege could not exist without white supremacy. White supremacy is a doctrine of racial superiority that justifies discrimination, segregation, and the domination of people of color based on an ideology and belief system that considers all non-white groups inferior. White supremacy and oppression go hand in hand. To maintain uh, conformance and the silence of people of color, white supremacy as a doctrine and belief is instilled through education and enforced by biased institutional policies or practices. In the US, in school, we're taught that Columbus discovered America, that the pioneers settled the West, that differences are deviant, the myth of the melting pot, positive portrayal of white people, negative portrayals of minority groups, and the internment of Japanese Americans and the separation of young um, immigrant Latin American children from their families was based on national security and not racism. The irrational sense of entitlement is a dominant feature of white supremacy. And more insidious are the benefits that accrue to white individuals or white Americans from these historical events. Even if completely free of conscious racial prejudice um, and the desire to forego or disclaim white privilege, um, whites still receive benefits automatically and unintentionally. Now, this is not to discount people's individual accomplishments or struggles. Not all white people enjoy the same level of privilege and many grapple with the same issues of people of color, like poverty and lack of health care. But as noted earlier, the system is set up in such a way as to advantage whites and disadvantage racial and ethnic minorities. Uh, nearly everyone, uh, particularly in wealthy countries like the US, has something someone else does not. Um, and it's important for us uh, to self-reflect and explore the ways in which we may benefit or not benefit from whiteness. Um, and so how does the complexion of our skin and the ways in which our behavior uh, replicate white uh, normativity um, to help us navigate the world? Um, so we have sort of racial privilege, but then there are also many other privilege systems like gender uh, privilege, heterosexual privilege, economic privilege, able-bodied privilege, educational privilege, and religious privilege. And so, um, as Roxanne Gay notes, um, acknowledging uh, your own privilege is not a denial of the ways in which you've been marginalized or have suffered. Um, and we all have our own privilege list. So for example, myself, 
Um, I have heterosexual privilege. Um, you know, I received widespread recognition and support for getting engaged um, and married to a man. Um, I'm able to live with my partner and do so openly. Um, I'm able to express affection um, to my partner in most social situations and not expect hostile or violent reactions from others. I learned about romance and romantic relationships from fiction movies and, and TV where I was able uh, to see heterosexual couples. Um, I also have my own Latina, uh, light-skinned Latina privilege, right? I see Latinos who look like me on TV and at work. I can find makeup that matches my skin tone. I can walk into most beauty salons and find someone who knows how to cut and style my hair. And no one ever questions my Latinidad. Um, unlike some, some other friends of mine um, who are, um, I guess that you would consider um, sort of darker skin or, or more Afro-Latino, um, who people question, well, you don't look Hispanic to me. So those are things that I don't have to confront that they, that they do, right? And so in that sense, that is my own privilege. And so I wanna call everyone's attention uh, to this addressing exercise. Um, that was originally developed by Pamela, Pamela Hayes. Addressing is an acronym that calls into attention nine key cultural influences and related minority and dominant cultural groups. Now, um, we all fall on different sides of the spectrum with regard to these different categories. So thinking about age and general, age and generational influences. So in terms of the dominant group that tends to be young, younger or middle-aged adults. Non-dominant non group tends to be children and older adults. Developmental or other disability. So the dominant group is non-disabled people, whereas the non-dominant or minority group are those who are suffering from some sort of cognitive, intellectual, sensory, physical, or psychiatric disability. We have religion and spirituality. Uh, here in the US, the, the non-dominant group is Christian and secular whereas minorities are Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, and, and other religions. With, we have ethnicity and, and racial um, identity. And so the, do, the, the dominant group in the US is European Americans, whereas everyone else, Asian, South Asian, Latinx, Pacific Islander, African, Arab, African American, Middle Eastern, multiracial people are in the minority. We have social economic status, upper and middle class, the dominant, Whereas those of lower SES um, as defined by occupation, education, income, or living in an inner city, um, you tend to be in the minority. We have indigenous heritage, the dominant group. Um, once again, European Americans, where was we have American Indi Indians, uh, in Inuit, Alaska Natives, um, Meti, Native Hawaiians, New Zealand Maori, um, Aboriginal Australians, all in the minority. Uh, with, with regard to national origin, um, here in the US, it's US born American citizens. Everyone else is in the minority. And then finally, we have gender. So men or males of the dominant group um, and women and transgender individuals are in the minority. And so one thing that I would like everyone uh, to take a few minutes is to really take a few minutes uh, and actually complete this exercise and really consider where you fall along these different categories. Um, so for instance, when I do this for myself in terms of cultural influences, um, you know, I consider myself um, an older millennial, right? So I'm definitely in that dominant group. I don't have a disability. Uh, so once again, I'm in the dominant group. Um, my uh, religious background is Roman Catholic, um, and so um, not exactly a mainstream Christian uh, religion here in the U.S., uh, so I'll put a maybe uh, for the dominant group. Um, my ethnic and racial, racial identity is Latina, um, and so definitely not in the dominant group. Socioeconomic status is currently middle class, so yes, I'm in the dominant group, although and considering my upbringing, I was working class. Uh, so um, earlier on in life, I was not in the dominant group. Um, I was born here in the US, I'm a citizen. So once again, in the dominant group, and I'm a female. Um, so I identify as a cisgender female, 
um, or a cisgender woman, and I, um, I'm definitely not in the dominant group uh, with regard to gender. Um, and so this, Pamela Hayes likes to call this our constellation of uh, privileges um, and disadvantages. Right, so it's, it's one important thing to consider as we consider our own positions um, in society um, and in particular um, in regard to different privilege systems. So finally, um, as we, after we um, learn more about ourselves, um, it's important to learn about other people, right? So to begin to consider, uh, to learn about people who are different from yourself. Um, so if we're going to learn about uh, different cultural groups, it's really important to try to learn um, about people of color from sources of strength uh, within the group, right? So we want to learn from sources uh, within the group. Uh, we want to make sure um, that we're making an effort um, to learn from um, strong, healthy examples of, of individuals. And we're, and really the goal here um, is to learn from experiential reality, right? So to attend community meetings, attend uh, different uh, religious uh, services, um, get involved in, in different community efforts, right? In order to learn about uh, people who are different from yourself. And finally, um, it's really important to consider what we can do as individuals, um, the personal action that we can take against racism in our society to really challenge racism and in particular systemic racism. Um, and so dealing with racism means a personal commitment to action. Um, and so some things that we can do to listen to and amplify black and minority voices to pay attention to the voices of people who experience racism every day, share their stories with um, your friends and family, uh, call out bigotry and hate speech. Um, there's been a disturbing increase in hate speech in the US in recent years. And if you see something um, on social media or in the newspaper that reflects prejudice, leave a comment or write a letter to the editor to let others know that intolerant marks are unkind or uncalled for. If you overhear someone tell a racist joke, speak up and let them know um, that stereotyping isn't harmless. Uh, let your children know um, they should feel free to speak up as well. Um, there's nothing funny about using humor to normalize dangerous ideas and, per and, per and to perpetuate ugly stereotypes. Um, it's important to teach uh, children about kindness, fairness, and human rights. Uh, prejudice and hate are not innate. They are learned behaviors um, and they can be unlearned. So set a good example. Talk to your children regularly about differences in racism. Explain that racism is a system of unfairness and it has a long history in our country. Every human being has a right to feel safe and valued and to be treated fairly. If we wanna fix the problem, we need to discuss it openly and be vigilant about it in our daily lives. Um, take initiative to make sure that minority candidates um, are fairly considered in your place of employment. Support campaigns of political candidates, candidates who will advocate for social justice. Um, you know, are among uh, some of the things that many of us can do uh, to, to really challenge racism. Um, and with that, I open up the floor uh, to questions. Uh, since Jasmine is our last talker, we, we you know we opened the stage for some questions. If uh, if anyone has uh, anything for this particular talk or in general, so uh, you know use your chat box or raise your hand. Um, this is Marilyn again. I do have a question. Um, so I've been involved in um, racism re uh, reduction for a good 20, 25 years, and I'm wondering. We encourage white folks to support people of color and to speak up and to, to get out there and use your voice. But I was wondering if there are any studies on the consequences that white folks face because they support people of color. There is a very succinct uh, consequence for supporting people of color. You, you are punished 
in very subtle ways for those actions. And I was just wondering if there are any studies on that or has anyone read uh, publications in that matter? Uh, you know, I um, am not aware of that literature, but Marilyn, I believe that you raise a very important point. You know, it, this is this is not, um, you know, being an ally and, you know, really going against, you know, people in your immediate network. Um, that could be something that's very, very hard to do. Um, and, you know, um, and, and, and it's something that sort of um, takes a good amount of bravery. And so, you know, one can hypothesize that, um, that, that, that that can involve, um, you know, some impact. I don't know, any of the other speakers, any, anyone else familiar with this particular literature? I'm not, I'm not sure if this addresses the question directly, Marilyn, but in looking at the bystander intervention research, uh, there, there are some things that uh, help, will help support the bystanders. So, you know, if what they're doing is aligned with their values and goals, if we spend time dispelling any myths that might contribute to the sense of uh, oppression, that tends to enhance one's tendency to bystand effectively. And also um, self-efficacy, having, having the impression that you can, you can make a difference as a bystander. So those are just some thoughts that come to mind. Um, I'm thinking also, Marilyn, there might be something around, um, Michael Dumas is a scholar, um, I believe in education, I'm going to look it up, but he talks a lot about the whole idea of undoing whiteness. Um, so I'm going to look that up. I'm going to look at his, he was on campus just a few years ago, um, and I think he's friends with Jason Williams. I'm going to look up that work and uh, send you a link, send you something. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. I mean, you know, we are living in a capitalist country. It's structured for certain purposes. And there are right. these friends, white friends, who have indeed experienced the consequences of speaking up and supporting people who don't look like them. So I appreciate that. I know there's also some literature in social psych about kind of how people react to those who stand up against prejudice, for instance. I don't think that's exactly your question, but um, I'll look around and see if I can pull together some resources to, to send your way as well. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Any, any more questions to anyone of the speakers? Um, I've sat here through all of these presentations, nice, quiet black woman. And, uh, you know, I think when I spoke with you, Yoav, I said that the problem that we are facing and dealing with today has to be addressed by white people. That all too often what happens when we deal with these kinds of situations, folks will turn to black people and ask them to how to remedy the situation that we're in. So I was pleased to hear some of my colleagues say that we as white people have to address that and see the nature of some of the research that's been done. What hits me very, very hard and why I teach psychology of the black experience is that there's very, very little discussion on what psychology has done to bring us to this place that if we look at prominent psychologists that we teach in Psych 101, Psych 203, and we hear what they have had to say about African people at international conferences, the footprint that they have put down to color the way in which uh, African people were studied, the way in which they are viewed, and how that fuels the attitudes and stereotypes that we have to deal with today. So that has to be put out there and, and then undone. You know, the microaggressions that we experience around intelligence, for example. You know, we see the Cyril Burke story has disappeared, but we don't tell what happened and how that might fuel what people are still saying and assuming 
about African American people today. Your G. Stanley Halls, your, your folks like that, that were prominent leaders in psychology who laid down very, very disparaging um, work about African people around the world. The other piece that's important is that, you know, I'm listening to a lot of scholarly discourse that happens between scholars and is not getting to the common community. So all of this rich research that we see that addresses a problem that we have not yet defined, um, I think is something that needs to be addressed. So I heard Sally say in my courses, I start to talk about some of these things. Uh, you know, and I think that's very, very important for us. I think it's important for us, and I said this in my response to the students who addressed the psychology department, for us to continue discussions like this and take it well beyond, you know, this, this Zoom status that, that we're in and offer something more to the, the university and recognize as an institution of higher ed what our responsibility is as primary social change agents. I, uh, I agree with that. Uh, what? I agree with that. And I think that uh, part of the impetus for this uh, meeting was to get it out to the public and uh, we'll make it available. I mean, we're recording this, we'll make it available. And I think the next time we do it, I like the Zoom medium because it's easy to access. You yeah, know, right and, now that's, that, that's what we have. Yeah, but that's it's also easy to access. It's also easy to access. Uh, you know, you don't need to drive to campus. And I think next time we have to get it out on social media so yeah. people from the community will join Do us. webinars, whatever the case may be. You know, and I'll say this, you know, about our department in particular, I heard folks say things like, uh, you know, you have to make sure people are treated fairly and, and that we advance an agenda. So, I mean, we're, when we're hiring folks, we can't keep duplicating ourselves over and over. When we look at what we want, we, you, can't, you have to assume Black people are not going to get postdocs and all of these extra opportunities because we don't have that kind of privilege. We're not gonna get promoted in that way. So we have to look at what folks bring to the table that could advance us in the situation. In this department, I'll tell you something that's weird. I, you, John Paul, wait, you, there you are. You, you know, what was weird for me before we had a major international explosion, I got a weird email from John Paul Wilson. I'm going, well, listen to this. He's writing me as a black woman in the psychology department asking me, what can I do to help you at a time like this? And acknowledging some of the things that black faculty might have to bear. That was one person in the department. So, you know, I think he a different kind of white guy. So, <laughs> who need a haircut right now, <laughs> what well, he do? So, you know, I thank you for that. You know, and I feel a lot better listening to what some of my colleagues have said that they are saying in, in some of their classrooms. But the work for us to do is, for, is big for us to do. And what's most important, we got to look at those nativistic themes that stand in the way of studying black people we have got to bring to light what psychology has done to bring us to this point. If we don't address that, we're not gonna go any place at all. And I think to that point, there was um, an APA webinar last week about race and racism and or town hall meeting. And one of the things that came up was the way in which certain kinds of research are privileged in psychology. So the numbers get privileged over the qualitative. And in all honesty, I don't think that they have to be mutually exclusive, um, but the way things get valued in the university also, right, is something we have to look at. Because if we have scholars who come in who are very good at theory and qualitative research, 
but that doesn't get valued in the university because it doesn't get the same grant money, then we might also then continue to perpetuate these, these disparities at all levels because of the systems that are already in place. So I think so many people pointed out today how the systems that are in place help to maintain the problem. We have to really take a look at how those systems keep us in the same place we are. And if we are going to change things, we have to look at the way the systems operate to keep people out and listen to the people who've been kept out so that they can let you know, this is the reason I couldn't access what I needed. I, I, I acknowledged John Paul on an email the other day when I sent out something to the department, but I wanna say publicly with Dr. Collins that I am so very thankful to you for reaching out to me as a colleague and saying, I know how hard this is for you. I know that people are likely to call on you to ask you to solve the problem in ways that they do not call on me. And I am so grateful that somebody just said, yes, I notice that the burden may be heavier for you, except that the expectations of you in this university are the same as they are for me. And that's what we often miss. We often miss that the burden is heavier for some people but the expectations of them are the same. Nobody looks to lighten that burden. We have to go through and carry it and still try to meet the demands that are on all of us as faculty members. Well, yeah, I would, I would just echo what Dr. Collins said uh, a couple minutes ago about the responsibility uh, you know, that it should follow largely on um, faculty, a white faculty like myself, um, as we... As Careful, we, John, you sounded like a black woman. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. All right. Oh, it's up. Oh, it's up. Okay, so is, is, is anyone else? Uh, I mean, it's it's open floor. Is anyone else uh, speaking? I um, please. Anything. Yo, uh, this means that you, as the chairperson of this of the psychology department, have to carry these conversations forward, and that whatever form they take. It cannot stop here. Well, it's a stop. Is that a yes? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. I'll have a conversation with the UCC. I mean, we got our work cut short this year, but but definitely looking at the curriculum and 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 the, the hiring practices is is a top priority. So definitely that. Uh, I just wanted to, um, just to let you know, I invited school partners to this conversation because I thought it, I didn't realize it was for the psychology department proper, but you know. Um, it was open, it was open. Oh, oh, okay. So there are school partners on this uh, Zoom. And the nice thing is to remember that these are the students you're going to receive in a few years. So the conversations that we're having now will be very relevant to them because they have been impacted by what we are all experiencing um, with the protests, but also with COVID. There's a lot of psychological challenges uh, that our children are facing that you will be receiving in a number of years. So um, I've encouraged our school partners to reach out to your department before um, consultations. So I'm hoping some of you are open to that sort of, um, it's a privilege, actually. I'm just gonna put it like that. It's a privilege for the university and the schools to be connected. So I will leave it at that. I gotta go to work. <laughs> okay, Marilyn, thank you. Thanks you for, for, for coming. Um, I think the department needs to find a way to disseminate her finding uh, to the community in an actionable way. Uh, and and you know this is a start, but 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 certainly not the end, as as, as Dr. Collins says. And um, we are basically at the end of the year, so expect more things to come as the faculty chime in and help me to carry this con this conversation forward. I mean, I organized this in five days, but we can do a lot better uh, when I have some help. So 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 definitely, uh, you know. Uh, carry the conversation forward and in, in, 
in, in an actionable way, not just talking about but do, do, doing things to, uh, to make the situation better. So um, I'll thank everybody to sticking with us since 10 a.m. And if there's no more questions, I will bid you farewell. I have one last question. Yes. So since we have the partners, this is Melissa Velas, uh, since we have the partners at the, um, you know, the pre-K through 12 levels, I'm wondering if one way, um, if one way of addressing this may be to have never caught, um, you know, the Washington's relentless pursuit of their runaway slave Ona judge as required reading. Like every time we talk about Washington, every time we talk about quote unquote founding fathers, is it part of the curriculum to say, this is the real deal? Melissa, do you mean K-12 or at the higher ed level? I'm, I'm confused. Oh, sorry, K-12. Well, you know, these things have to go to curriculum committee and through all the gatekeepers and all of that jazz. So if you want, come to the TEPC meeting next year and we can talk about it further. Okay. And and Thank Melissa, you. there's an Amistad Commission in New Jersey that's charged with making those, there's an Amistad, a Holist Cost Committee, there's all kinds of committees in the K-12 system that are charged with making sure that it responds to these issues of inequity and diversity. Oh, good. Thank you. So, thanks everybody for joining us.